Good evening. Welcome to the Mayoral Candidates Forum and welcome to Teachers College. We're thrilled to host this important conversation about the future of education, the arts, and culture in New York City. And we could not have asked for better partners to co-sponsor this forum with than Young Audiences New York and 1% for Culture. My thanks to the candidates here this evening and to our wonderful moderators, Kurt Anderson and Leonard Lopate. This is sure to be an engaging and productive discussion of the candidates' plans to support education, arts, and culture, which as we know are indispensable to the creative, intellectual, and economic vitality of this city. Teachers College has a long history of involvement with New York City schools, as well as with arts and cultural organizations. In fact, we are this year celebrating our 125th anniversary, so it's a very long involvement. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the occasion has caused us to reflect on our historical impact and involvement. For example, we founded the field of arts education here at Teachers College. We founded the nation's first community school. And right now, we're partnering with Harlem Schools in, in intensive work in education, the arts, and um, community well-being. We're eager to make an even greater difference in communities throughout New York City in the years to come. In the spirit of this TC legacy, we look forward to working with the next mayor to ensure a successful future for our young people and for all New Yorkers. Enjoy the evening. Good evening, I'm Robert Reisenberg, board president of Young Audiences New York. Uh, I've been asked to introduce Kurt Anderson tonight, but first, before I do that, I would like to thank our partners uh, who have helped make this evening possible, Teachers College and 1% for Culture. Uh, it's truly been a team effort. I would also like to extend our gratitude to our moderators and the candidates who are here with us tonight. This year, Yanni, Young audiences celebrate 60 years of impacting the lives of New York City's students through the transformative power of arts education. So it is fitting that here tonight in the greatest cultural city in the world, we are part of an event that will shine a light on the importance of the arts to all our lives. Now to Kurt Anderson. You all know him as the host of NPR Studio 360. He is also an author of several novels, a regular contributor to publications such as Vanity Fair, The New York Times, and Time Magazine. And if that's not impressive enough, he has written and produced numerous television projects for the broadcast networks and HBO and has co-authored the long-running off-Broadway theatrical review entitled Loose Lips. We are very fortunate to have Kurt and his associate, Leonard Lopate, as our moderators. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Uh, I think um, my, my job has already been accomplished, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to carry on in any case. Um, uh, I was introduced as uh, Frederick Beinecke. Actually, I'm called Rick uh, Beinecke. I'm uh, one of the founding uh, members of the steering committee of 1% um, for Culture. And on, uh, on behalf of 1% um, for Culture, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. And uh, we're all really impressed with uh, a day such as this, one of the most beautiful days in New York that you're here and not on the beaches of New York, but uh, this will be a really interesting evening. Um, our uh, organization is a coalition of arts organizations, nonprofit organizations in New York. It presently is a coalition of 530 organizations throughout the city, throughout all, all the boroughs of the city in support of, of our effort. Uh, we thank our, our co-hosts um, for uh, uh, being our partners in this uh, very important uh, event, Teachers College and Young Audiences uh, New York. <clears throat> and we're uh, actually all, all of us are delighted with the turnout uh, that's here tonight. 1% for uh, Culture uh, has been joined, has joined <clears throat> with prominent leaders uh, in the business, uh, civic, and cultural communities in seeking to increase city funding <coughs> for culture to 
uh, of the municipal expense budget. Right now, the city's support for culture is currently less than one quarter of that rather modest uh, level. <clears throat> Our city is host to thousands of cultural and creative artists and over uh, 1,300 nonprofit cultural organizations. These organizations span from performing arts organizations of, of uh, music, dance, and theater uh, to museums, theaters, zoos, botanical gardens, and on to arts and ethnic festivals in the city. We're pleased that culture will be one of the focal points of this forum tonight uh, and are very interested in what the mayoral candidates uh, will have to say about the city's support for culture. Culture represents a significant contribution to our economy and to the growing and sustained safe and vibrant communities in each of our boroughs, all five boroughs. Culture represents the best of New York. It represents and is education. It improves the quality of life in our city and it generates jobs. Our cultural organization are major attractions for tourists to the city and consequently significantly impact our hospitality industry. I'm pleased now to introduce Leonard Lopate, who is a Peabody Award winner. I just learned uh, moments ago that Kurt also has his own award, uh, both important, important awards in their uh, industry. Uh, Leonard, as you know, is the longtime host of the Leonard Lopez show, show on uh, WNYC. He, uh, Leonard is uh, over 28 years, uh, interviewed many, many prominent can candidates um, in, in uh, all professions, and uh, we're looking forward to his joining uh, tonight with Kurt Anderson to um, Inter interview the panel of uh, candidates we have here. Uh, I welcome you, Leonard, and uh, appreciate you and Kurt taking on this responsibility. Th thank you very much. So, Kurt, do you um, want to lay out how we're going to do this? Yeah, as you see, there are only three chairs, which is to say you're not going to have 16 candidates up here. You're going to have one at a time for exactly 12 minutes apiece. It's uh, exactly well, more or less. Uh, we're talking about politicians. At, at, at first, <laughs> it, it, I said, oh, is this a sort of a speed dating event? Uh, but then I realized since education is one of our uh, big subjects, maybe it's more like the oral exams that uh, graduate students take. And because cultural is one of our subjects, maybe it's more like a series of 16 one-act plays. Uh, pick, your, pick your trope. Um, uh, our first uh, candidate tonight is uh, a, Dem a Democratic candidate, the Honorable Bill Thompson. Hey, how are you? How are you? Welcome, Mr. Thompson. It's a pleasure to be here. Good evening, everyone. So I don't need to tell you because you've uh, been on the Board of Education, ran the Board of Education for some years, but uh, I will, to set the table, our schools educate about 1.1 million students on a budget of about $20 billion. Of that $20 billion, a little over $300 million uh, or one and a half percent goes to teaching about and making music and pictures and sculptures and film and dance and theater. So total cost, 20,000 per student per year. Arts education, $300 of that $20,000. Would you make it a priority of your mayoralty to increase spending on the arts in the schools? And if so, in the ballpark, how much? I, I think it's always dangerous to pick a number exactly. But one of the things, and, and look, I think a lot of what you believe in is some of the things that you've done. I'm a New York City public school graduate, and I went to Midwood High School. I still remember what it was like playing the viola at Midwood High School. Now, I might not have been that good, but I was in the orchestra, and it, it, was, it taught so many different things. It taught discipline, and it's mathematics, and it's 
achievement and accomplishment. It's the things that you feel as a young person that really, while you may not be that good, it helps to boost your confidence. When I was at the Board of Education, and one of the things when people say, what are some of the things that you're proudest of when you were president of the New York City Board of Education? It was helping to bring art and music education back into the public school system. We made major commitments to it. We invested in art and music education because it was good for our students. And one of the more depressing things is in the last 10 years is to having watched that leave a public schools again. It has been taken out of a public school system. What I am in favor is investing again in art and music education within the schools. And it's not, you know, it, it doesn't have to be done from a central location. One of the things that we did that was excellent was we worked with community-based organizations, with artists in the neighborhood. They were on an approved list. Organizations and schools were able to kind of not work off of a one-size-fits-all. They were able to pick and choose whether it was visual arts, whether it was instruments, whether it was vocal, what, a number of different things, they were able to do that. So I want to bring art and music education back into a public school system. I think it's important that we baseline it again and don't allow, no matter what happens in the future, we can't allow those dollars to be taken out. So by baselining, in, among other things, do you mean this 60 odd million dollars a year that was uh, 15 years ago put in place to fund specifically arts that the Bloomberg administration six years ago said, no, spend it on whatever you want, principals. It would have to be, it would be baselined. I'd want a mandate, you know, with principals that that money has to be spent for art and music education. We'd want to work with them to help to develop, you know, kind of go back again on a community basis, which art and music, you know, education should be in each school. Work with them, let the schools make the decisions. As a matter of fact, it'd be nice for a change to involve parents in that discussion also and bring them into that conversation. But I'd want to baseline that money. I'd want to make, I want to mandate that it has to be spent in, and it needs to be more than $60 million. It has to be more than that. And make sure that it is used for art and music education. And then again, make sure that when times change, that that money's there, that that discretion to be able to use it for other things isn't there, it has to be used so, so in other words, because it's always easier to cut arts education, uh, you, would, you would segregate a certain budget line so that in tough times it, it remains at some basic sustainable level. Absolutely, and, and one of the other things, you know, the only way that it's going to stay, and the only way that it's going to be there is as part of your evaluation for schools, for principals, for other administrators, you'd have to include that. How have they gone about bringing art and music education back into a school system and how each and every year how is that? How does that continue in a school? I think it's important when particularly you happen to have, and, and, and one other thing. I remember as a child in a school trip going to visit the Museum of Natural History. And it was almost a, a love affair with dinosaurs when I was a child because I had the opportunity to go and to visit. And I still remember to this day. And that was a number of years ago. We have to have an opportunity for our children, again, our public school children, who are in the middle of arguably the art capital, art and music capital, the, the cultural capital of the world. Let them get back and do field trips so they can go and see some of the wonders that exist around them in all five boroughs. We need to do that again also. You, you said we need, because these days, we're, the, it's all about accountability and holding teachers and principals accountable for measurable success. It's easier to measure success on standardized tests about reading and math than it is your progress on the viola. Uh, ha, ha, so how, how ought arts education and, and its success or unsuccess be measured in our schools? There are some things that you can't measure. And I'd want to make sure, how can you measure? Has it been restored to schools? I think that's the measure, is in each and every school, have you brought art and music education back? Because the truth is, in the end, you know, the one thing, there are things that you can't measure. What it means to a child to be good in something, to have the opportunity to play an instrument, and one of the great crimes these days is in visiting a school and hearing that there are instruments in the basement that haven't been used in years, and the principal would love to do it, 
but there's no money to be able to do that. And I think it is in, in bringing art and music education back. Those are things that some children who may not be great in academics, it brings them back again. It brings them back the next day because they'll have the opportunity to sing and because they're good at it, or the opportunity to be able to paint and they're good at it. It's a way to be able to express themselves, a way to be able to build confidence, and it opens up a universe, a very different universe for them. That's what, and, and there is no way at times to be able to measure that. But, you know, in, at a certain point, in the long run, it should lead to lower dropout rates. It should lead to higher scores because a lot of children, because they're there, well, I want to make sure that I can participate. I want to make sure that I can do certain things. Let me work harder in my academics. It's all part of the things that you can't measure, but that you can feel. Rick Beneke um, pointed out some things. I'm going to repeat a few of them. Uh, WMIC, uh, New York City, I, I always say WMIC. I don't know why it's kind of... I, I wonder uh, why. <laughs> NYC nonprofit culture attracts over 98 million visitors to over 100,000 events, e exhibitions, performances, and uh, it attracts 23.8 million tourists to New York, generates an estimated $8.1 billion mm -hmm. a year, which is a major contribution to the city's economy, generates over 120,000 jobs, which also stimulates the economy, and yet it receives, as Rick pointed out, one quarter of 1% of the overall city expense budget. Uh, we subsidize banks, we subsidize other corporations to keep them in the city, and yet uh, many of these places are being driven out by high rents and high property costs. So, with that in mind, as mayor, what are your views on providing funding to the arts and cultural organizations? Do you feel that increasing the city's financial commitment to the nonprofit cultural community to a full 1% of the municipal expense budget is a realistic goal? I, I don't know in the current environment if it's realistic to say that we're going to jump to 1%. I think that we want to see an increase in expenditures in not just capital money, and, I, and let me, you know, I will say the Bloomberg administration has increased capital expenses, and that's good for arts and music groups. That's good for our culturals. But two things, over time, we've got to continue, we have to increase our expense, expenditures with culturals. We have to also, and, and my wife is here, uh, and, you know, Elsie McCabe Thompson. My wife was the head of the Museum for African Art. If I also don't mention not just some of the larger culturals and those in the CIG, but some of the smaller cultural groups that we have to look at also to be able to increase funding to them. Uh, and as well as, and a lot of those groups are spread out across the city of New York. They're not just in Manhattan, they're in all five boroughs. So do we, is it 1%? I don't know that that's the magic number. Do we have to increase expenses or expenditures and money in the city expense budget? The answer is yes. Well, the answer is definitely yes. During the Koch administration, uh, uh, a lot more money went to the, the arts than since. Uh, Bloomberg feels that philanthropists should give money, but if you're a small dance company, a, a small theater company, mm -hmm. uh, the, the philanthropists aren't going to give you any money. So um, this is a reason that uh, these institutions, these nonprofits, depend on the city, and uh, other cities are doing things to attract them. They're actually luring them away. They're luring artists away. Well, I, I, as I said, I agree that we have to increase our expense allocation to arts uh, and to culture in the city of New York. Is it going to get, to, I mean, can we set a goal at trying to get to 1%? That's a good idea. Well, what if Growing you think of them as businesses? Mm -hmm. Because these organizations are businesses. How might small business services and the New York City Economic Development Corporation serve them better? Well, I think in, in starting to highlight those organizations and providing the opportunity, giving the information out there about the smaller groups that exist across the city of New York. That would be a huge start about providing the opportunity or making the public and tourism aware and, and understanding that as tourism has continued to increase, you look at you know, some of our museums, they're in the top 10 as far as tourist attractions in the country. And that's why people come to New York City. A lot of them come for the cultural institutions. We want them to grow. But at the same point, we also want to continue to grow those culturals across New York City, tying in New York City and company and, and tourism to you know, cultural organizations and some of the smaller ones in Queens and Brooklyn and Staten Island and the Bronx, as well as in parts of Manhattan. Some of the great and small dance organizations uh, 
aren't receiving a lot of money. And those are areas, as they pointed out, the city can increase its allocation of dollars to. The Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, would like more money, but they don't need it. It's that little organization. Um, I just want to point it out. I might, I might not have said that directly, but, <laughs> but someone else did. And that's all we have time yeah, for. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wow, that was quick. Thank you again. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Are we already having our first break? Yes, exactly. I'm not going to do anything until I get the signal, the, the pre-agreed upon signal um, to, tell, to tell you all who the next candidate up is. Or I could just guess and hope. Uh, there you go. Any of you. Anyone, anybody want to run for mayor? Um, we, we already have so many people. How many, 20 people or so? Uh, not quite. Oh. Okay. One of them is not coming. Our, but, our uh, next, our next candidate is a uh, city council member, Democratic candidate, the Honorable Christine. Hi, how are you? Hi, Good to see you again. Nice to see you. Okay, no. So I don't know how much you heard about uh, of our conversation with Bill Thompson. Not zero. Okay, basically. So surprise me. Soundproof booth <laughs> back there. Totally. A cone came down, and you heard beautiful music the whole time. So they're going to get bored, but I'm going to repeat this. <laughs> New York City is home to over 1,300 nonprofit cultural institutions, hundreds of, well, at least thousands of artists. I think Williamsburg, I heard, has more artists per square inch than any other place in the country. Really? But a lot of them are leaving because they can't afford the rents. Um, nonprofit culture attracts 23.8 million tourists to New York, generates an estimated $8.1 billion a year which is a major contribution to the city's economy. It also generates 120,000 jobs, but it receives less than one quarter of 1% of the overall city expense budget. What have you done in the city council uh, when it comes to funding of the arts? Well, in the city council, I think if you look at, and I want to be give credit where credit's due, both in my tenure as speaker, but the truth is before that when Speaker Miller was speaker and Speaker Vallone as well, the council has long been the place that stands up and preserves funding for cultural organizations, both the larger ones, the CIGs, and the smaller program groups out there. Now, that's a, a good thing that we've done and an important thing that we've done. But the truth is we need to, and this will happen when I'm mayor, change more fundamentally how the budget is set up. You know, every year since really the council got budget powers after the charter change, Basically, every idea the council, every initiative or funding the council had put in the budget the year before gets cut out, even if you're in a year where there are surpluses. It's one thing if there's a year where there really has to be cuts. Now, look, I'm under no illusion that every idea we ever had in the council is a good one. Most. But that every funding idea we had every single time is a bad one and should be zeroed out is absurd. And so what ends up happening is the budget is not a reflection, in my opinion, of the priorities of the mayor. And then you end up in this real challenge where you're fighting every year if your cultural groups or libraries to exist. But this problem becomes compounded significantly in years when you are in deficits and you actually have to have conversations around cuts. We've had in areas of culturals and, and libraries, you know, looking at $100 million a year type thing just to stay constant, if not more. So when I'm mayor, what we're gonna do is have a budget that's really a priority-based budget. One where in the baseline of the budget, we have the things that we can afford, first and foremost, but the things that are fundamental to the city of New York. One of those is going to be cultural funding. Why is cultural funding fundamental to the city of New York? For the reasons you just said, and because it, and this is hard to put a dollar amount on, it helps fuel the soul of the city of New York. And remember, after September 11th, there were a number of significant things that the city government did and, and the mayor Giuliani did. One of the two of the, the very important things he did, which is important for us to remember, 
is he called the head of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he said, you can't be closed. You can't be closed. If you're closed, the world will think in part, I don't know exactly what he said, I'm paraphrasing, the world in part will think that the city is closed because our cultural institutions fuel the soul of this country. And they're that significant. So we need to remember that when we're thinking about funding. But then funding. he did call the Brooklyn Museum and said, I want to close you. So. Well, that's a whole <laughs> different kettle of fish. <laughs> right. He said, you're not the kind of beacon we're looking for. That's right. Uh, actually, that's the, right. the last mayor to... That's uh, funny. To I'm <laughs> taking you on the road. That's good. Ed Koch was the last mayor, surprisingly, to have been generous to the arts. And, and uh, Peter Vallone was the city council leader who probably pushed hardest I, to get funding for the... The arts. Meanwhile, at the same time, we have um, uh, the city giving money to startups to establish headquarters in the city. We give all sorts of uh, uh, tax breaks and incentives to banks. The American international group AIG, the insurance company at the center of the 2008 financial crisis, continued to benefit from a $23.8 million abatement from New York City at the same time it was being bailed out with $180 billion in federal money. And so we can find money, yep. even in tight times, for these corporations, but those other corporations, which we pointed out are really important to the health of the city, suddenly become targets whenever we will have to cut money. Uh, you're absolutely right. And that is a problem in the way we have done budgeting. I'm proud that in the council we've kind of been that final line of defense. But you're to kind of use a, I don't know why I would, but I'm going to a sports analogy here at this arts event, but we want to put arts on the offensive in the budget, right? And look at how we, uh, look at uh, an industry, and I know I, that seems a little awkward to say in arts because I don't want to minimize that, but in industries are industry. And part of what we're talking about is arts as a cultural, an e a, as an economic engine, and they should be part of that discussion. And part, one of the other things I want to do when I'm mayor is ch change and kind of broaden how the Economic Development Corporation looks at things. They've done a, you know, good work in many areas and, and had uh, focus in specific areas. They've never focused on arts as a, in a really significant way as, a cult, as an economic engine, and that's something I would change, which would f go into the kind of points you raised. But let me just mention one or two other things quickly. You know, one thing, new program the council put in place a number of years ago, well, two actually, one is using the science -based cultural institutions through Urban Advantage to help do teacher training and help get science training and science teachers to be even more successful. That's a model that Miami is now replicating and other cities. That's the kind of thing we should work on, as well as the CASA program, which Councilmember Dominic M. Recchia Jr. created, where you partner schools and cultural institutions has been enormously successful as well. And those are creative ways we can use our institutions to even greater power. So are you those willing to commit 1% of the city's budget to support of, of the arts institutions? You know, I, I'm not, and I'm not going to, you know, there's other events, parks, et cetera, where people I want to we're going to get one whatever. candidate to say yes tonight. tonight. You're not. <laughs> I bet you're not. I bet you're not. But you know what? That's not a bad thing. Because look, you actually want candidates to come and say those kind of conversations have to happen in a budget context, not in a political context. And I don't think that's a bad thing that people are not, you know, necessarily saying that. Speaking it's the best that I'm not saying it because I'm not saying it in the nicest way possible. But speaking of the partnerships between schools and uh, independent cultural organizations to to fill in, frankly, to do backfill where there are not right. enough right. Uh, arts teachers. Um, that or, of course, or in, in, the, in case of science helping in that area. But, but we're talking about arts and culture here. So, and that isn't free, and those budgets have... Science is culture. Ask the Museum of Natural History. Eh, okay. Uh, uh, it's not arts, though. Uh, anyhow. Um, Especially the, in a Petri dish. The, the, the costs, the, the budget for supplies, musical instruments, equipment has been just mm -hmm. yes. astonishingly slashed the last six years. Um, there, there is a resolution, uh, has been introduced six years ago or something, Resolution 837, to, to, to dedicate a line of, of funding to arts education in the schools. Why, hasn't, why haven't you passed that? You know, I'll take a look at that resolution. You know, one of the challenges with uh, dedicating things in the Department of Education budget like that is 
you know, we, we think of schools as mayoral control, which there is, but the DOE is not a full necessarily city agency, so some of the stuff that you could do theoretically in, you know, parks or DOT or something is not necessarily the same. But the larger point there of getting more money into the classroom, A, generally, but B, specifically for arts, is something you're going to see happen when I'm mayor. We have so much Really, money. you'll do better than this administration? Absolutely. Absolutely. I make that. I can't tell you the number, but I make that commitment to do better tonight. And I know we can find those resources in the Department of Education. We have way too many outside contracts for things that are just not as critical, just not as critical as the kind of programs and funding that you're talking about. Should, for instance, every high school, every school, for that matter, have a music teacher, which at this point, they're nowhere close to? That would, be, that would be a goal I would want to move towards. I can't tell you when we're going to get there. And I would want to do it in prioritized order. And I would start with the schools with the worst reading levels. Because that's the place where you would want to start first with arts and music. We're starting in September in a partnership between the council, the DOE, and Robin Hood in 20 middle schools where 7th and 8th graders read below grade level, extending the school day by two hours. Harvard Ed Labs is going to come in and partner to do literacy in those two hours. And part of the way they're going to do it is through music and art. So I think that would be where I'd want to start with adding those teachers in. Right. Christine Quinn, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do I leave this with you? No. Okay. Thank you very yeah. Much. Our next candidate is a Republican candidate, John Katsitamides. Sure. So I'm, you're going to find me, even though this is an arts and culture uh, conversation, uh, talking a lot about uh, budgeting and funding because we can all say, yeah, we want arts in the schools and we want to play instruments, but it, it does come down to a question of is there money to do this? Uh, should there be, first of all, if, if we're spending one and a half percent of you know, our entire DOE budget, our operating budget for the schools on, on all forms of arts, music, everything, bands, uh, should that be more? Well, you know, I, I grew up at public schools. I went to PS 192 back in the 50s. I went to Brooklyn Tech High School in the 60s. I'm a product of public school education. Um, we grew up with music. We grew, grew up with some arts. I think we're uh, taking away from our students today, and uh, we should provide more. Uh, when you say the budget is very flexible, uh, you know, when you spend a couple hundred million dollars on some of those bicycle lanes, when you spend a couple hundred million dollars on building hills on Governor's Island, there's plenty of money. It's allocation. Thank you. And you know what it comes down to? Whom do you trust to do the right thing for the kids? And I'm in it. Look, I'm a successful businessman. I made a ton of money. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, no, I'm not ashamed of it. That's what America's all about. Only in America, land of opportunity. I grew up on 135th Street, just 15 blocks from here. And I did well. Uh, I'm in it. I don't need a job going in. I don't need a job going out. Nobody owns me. The only reason I'm doing this is I want to do the right thing for our city. I want to do the right thing for the students, and I want to do the right thing for our city. And, and what is the right thing? I mean, you're, as you say, you're a very successful businessman. You're, uh, as, in that role, you, you, you look at numbers, you read mm -hmm. metrics, you see how things are going. Uh, I, I want to well, I was in, I was in um, uh, an event in uh, Long Island City, and there was a professor there. He says, in 1951, our students were number two in the world as far as being students. Now, God knows, I think we're number 36. 
This That's is a shame. Amer American students. American students. That's a shame. And we have to take responsibility and we have to do something to fix it. Uh, I've been saying things widely in every event I went to that uh, our 35 to 40 percent dropout rate for high school students is wrong. Uh, somebody uh, made a decision in good conscience. They, they, they wanted to do the right thing 35 years ago that everybody should get an academic course. But that's not true. That's not right. Uh, I've been advocating uh, pushing trade courses. You know, when I went to Brooklyn Tech, we took foundry, we took machine shop, we took all kinds of courses. We could train as an alternative to dropping out and going to work for Burger King for $8 an hour. Let's give them an alternative. Let's teach them how to be a carpenter, electrician, a plumber. They can make $60,000, $70,000 a year and be able to live in a middle class family. Let's teach people how to be nurses. Let's teach people how to earn a living. Uh, and I think we should have alternative teaching for our students in lieu of the only decision they can make is just to drop out. And if, when you're given a number like the fact that 20% of New York City schools have no full-time arts teacher of any kind. It's wrong. So every school should have a full-time arts teacher. Uh, absolutely correct. I think uh, our, New York City is the greatest city in the world. And I believe we should have arts. We should have music. I, rem I remember the, my first music teacher. You know? And, and our kids are looking to us for a future and education. They're looking, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for hope. And that's one of the reasons I'm running. Look, I'm successful. I want to be able to go to these neighborhoods and say, look, I made it. You could make it too. And that's what I'm going to do. Because that's what I'm doing this for. And I think I can give hope to these kids. I've been with Mr. Morgenthau on the Police Athletic League for 28 years. I'm not a Johnny come lately. 28 years, we're going to those neighborhoods saving kids. The other problem in those neighborhoods, how, you know what percentage? 40 years ago, when Senator Moynihan, I was talking to him, 25% of, of those kids in those neighborhoods were single parent homes. You know what they are now? Closer to 70%. Shame. We have to look. We, and how does the mayor? Solve, how does the mayor of New York? We're not going to solve. I'm not here to tell you we're going to solve the whole world's problems in one day. But it's the same thing with the police athletic league. Maybe we can save another 10 percent, another 20 percent. That's what I want to do. Save some of them. Teach them a trade. Teach them how to make a living. Teach them how to join the middle class. That's important. You need people that care, not care about where they're going to get their next $100,000 from to run for, for a city council or whatever. I mean, that's all they care about is raising money. And I'm here. I just want to do the job. You guys are doing a great job in our schools. And oh, I can't read that far. I mean, you know, I'm getting old. You know yeah, I, mean? I have to jump in now. Please. Um, you, um, you have a number of businesses in New York, uh, 2,000 employees here. Yes. You must be aware of how hard it is to keep any business flourishing when rents and property costs are constantly going Well, up. I've joked around. If I, if I didn't have Gristides, I'd be higher up on the Forbes list. <laughs> yes. Well, that may be true. But still, uh, it's true. you can imagine what it's like for arts organizations who uh, have to pay uh, if we've, had, we've lost a major dance company to Chicago years ago because they couldn't afford to stay in New York. And, you know, between my wife and myself, we try to support a lot of these groups. Well, I've looked at your phil philanthropical uh, adventures, and they all seem to be, I didn't see any arts and cultural institutions. Well, I saw you know, a lot of worthy causes. A lot of worthy causes. Uh, Alzheimer's, yeah. the uh, Police Athletic League, but... I'll give you one right now. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for the last six months, I've been... Uh, uh, doing uh, uh, Tony LaBianco's play, May LaGuardia, because I really in enjoy his work. Uh, and we are, the first two weeks of August, we're doing uh, probably about 10 more shows. You're producing it? 
Am um, I producing? I'm the executive producer. You know what that means? Yes. I write the check. Mm. Do you, do, would you as mayor make a firm commitment to give more money to the arts than we're getting right now, which is one quarter of 1% of the city's total budget, considering the major role that the arts play in the city's economy. They draw tourists. 110%, because you know why? I really believe it. And I'm not a professional politician. Ask people around. When I make a commitment, I keep it. Just one other thing. You uh, once said, I'm a Manhattanite. I feel sorry for those people who aren't. Would arts organizations <laughs> in the, uh, the other four boroughs uh, be well, happy to hear that? Uh, well, you know, it, thank you for the audience to clarify that. Okay? That was Crane's magazine, and they apologized the week after, but absolutely. They, they published one story in the front page, and they published everything else in page 47. <laughs> I was talking about our supermarket business at that time, and, and nobody said anything about it, that we had like 57 stores in Manhattan and we had like five stores in the outer boroughs. And that was the only thing I was talking about when I was talking the outer boroughs. Because the Manhattan stores at that time were making money, the outer boroughs were not. Actually, I understand. I used to do advertising for Bohack, the late lamented Bohack chain. My condolences. Uh, <laughs> yes. Did well, you to get them, paid? Yeah, well, I worked for the ad agency. We got paid. But, um, and it was owned by uh, the same people who owned in Paramount. Galfin and Devour. Yes. Was, anyway. Was that the nickname, Golf and Duvall? <laughs> Golf and Western. Yes, Golf and Western. Mr. Cosmatidis, yes. thank you so much. I enjoyed this. Thank you very much. And <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. It's John Liu next. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm finding it hard to see her. Who? The this woman with the... the I can yeah. see. Okay. It's right ahead of you. Thank you. And our next candidate, uh, another uh, a Democrat candidate, Mr. Eric Salgado. Welcome. How you doing? Hello. I'm white. Have you um, been hearing any of the previous things? Yes, I was here early and I was listening. So to I don't have to ask you all the same questions I've asked the other ones. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you basically, know basically uh, the thrust of my questions are uh, the arts are really important to New York's economy and we treat them rather shabbily. Uh, the city gives much less money to them percentage wise than other major cities. Other major cities are even doing things to lure artists away from the city that most people associate with the arts. Right now, we are the world's greatest arts center. So as mayor, are you willing to make some kind of major commitment to supporting the arts? Uh, we're asking for 1% of the city's total budget, a lot less than the city gives to keep banks in the city. I already come into that 1%. My name is Eric Salgado. Thank you all for inviting me over here. Uh, in fact, the, my campaign manager, Edwin Marcial, he's the president of the modern ter uh, Puerto Rican theater in El Barrio. I, I, please, I want him to stand up. And um, I do understand the essential importance to have uh, uh, this um, art um, uh, programs in place in our city, especially when it comes to our uh, uh, children educational. Uh, New York City right now is not a melting pot anymore. It's a collection of different community with different culture. And that's how we could preserve our culture, how could we reflect, and how could we also keep our children occupied in good things. I thank God I got six children for them. They play different instruments. Um, they do it for the church, but uh, I'm proud of them. And I have to spend my own money to actually make sure that they get this kind of education because currently right now it's very difficult to find program in different communities. One of the ideas that I have is because when it comes to the community-based organization, the non-for-profit organization, they are more than eager to help the different community, but the number one obstacle that they have is location. It's so difficult to, to actually finance a location to uh, do many uh, 
cultural program in the city, but we have the location. We have 1,745 school buildings that are now being used after three o'clock, after five o'clock in the weekends. So one of the plans I have is to actually run a program where all the community-based uh, organization and non-for-profit organization could have access to this school building to actually provide this program to the different community. We had to make sure that our, you, our young people are occupied in this program and now on the street where they are occupying doing other things and getting in trouble. Well, the young people are really Kurt's province. I'm talking about the older people <laughs> who also want to take uh, want to partake of the arts and and live through that, that, participation in the arts and that, find it the really difficult could, here. The school building could be used for many things. If you have a, a, a non-for-profit organization that is promoting art, it could be for a child, for an adult, for an older. If you give them access to our school facility in non-school hour, that's going to be very beneficial for all community. We have the building. We have to even keep the air condition on at night in this building. Might as well use it in non-school hours. Would you be willing to produce and fund a comprehensive cultural plan for New York City which engages all branches of government and calls for interagency participation? Definitely, and uh, well, we also have to make sure that um, the resources are actually uh, spread throughout the city, throughout the big uh, organization and also the small organization because it's getting, it's getting very difficult for small organizations to get access to this grant and to these resources that the city has. It's always the, you know, the same organization that getting the, the benefit, but we have to make sure that all organizations get benefit because the city changed a lot. I mean, my father came to New York City in 1926. I was born here in 1970, although they took me to Puerto Rico, and then I came back when I was 17. But I see the city change to different stages, and we have to make sure that every time the city change, it could be the demographic, the sub-demographic, that all these programs, the new programs that are basically uh, coming because of the necessity of a new a community arising or a new population arising in the city, they also get access to this funding as well. Um, you want to use schools after hours for nonprofit cultural organizations because, as you say, they're there and not necessarily being used at night. But what about uh, schools during the day as schools? For instance, uh, charter schools have doubled in the last four years. They're, they are growing tremendously. Now 5% of New York City children go to charter schools. Should that continue to double? Should it be 10% in another four years? Well, um, I'm for charter school. I believe that um, you know, uh, there is not a problem if, if they save in the city a uh, thousand or thousand of dollars and the parent, they should have a choice for their own children. In fact, for people who are actually financing the education of the children, I'm for to give them uh, a tax deduction from the real estate taxes because if they're not utilizing the $20,000 that costs for the education of their own child, at least they should get a tax credit to the real estate taxes for the good job that they're doing actually uh, by funding their children. Um, I'm a successful person. I'm not a billionaire like John Castell and Amiri, that's for sure. But people think that when you, you send your children to a, a private school, I was, I was raised in public school in Puerto Rico and here in New York. And, uh, but I also um, decide it was my choice to send my children to an evangelical school, and, uh, and I did an effort. People tend to think that when you send your children to private school is because you are rich, and that's not the, re the reality. Many, many people do it for many reasons, and if they're not utilizing the $20,000 that costs for the children's education, at least they should get an incentive by getting a uh, test credit. That's interesting. I mean, that's a, sen that's a different way of talking about vouchers, really, isn't it? Privacy. Yeah, voucher uh, right now through the, uh, we had to go through the state uh, legislator and they have uh, you know their own disclosure with the blame amendment that the the parochial school they, they don't apply. But uh, I decide I'm running for mayor. First of all, my commitment is with the people of the city of New York. If I could do that to the real estate taxes, then I don't have to bother with uh, Albany. We could do it locally over okay, here. Okay, again, you you you, you want to use uh, public school buildings uh, at night for other cultural, not for profit purposes, you want to give parents sending their kids not to public schools a uh, financial incentive for that. Again, I'm, I'm interested in, in schools and particularly arts education. That's one of our focuses. Yes, yes, right? yes. Well, I yeah. mean, like, for instance, 20% of schools have no 
full-time art teacher whatsoever in New York City. I, Half of schools have no full-time music teacher. I, I know, as other candidates have said, it's dangerous to, to, to commit to a number or a fact, but are 20% are, are with no arts teacher and 50% with no music teacher? Should, what, what should those percentages be? No, no, I believe that in our uh, Department of Education, with, first of all, I remember when I used to uh, go to school over here in IS88 in Brooklyn, they used to teach, you know, all these kind of, uh, of, of art uh, programs. And it was good. I mean, I, I didn't learn nothing in school, to, but, uh, you know, regardless to art, because I took shop and I, I do all the things. But we had to bring, bring those programs. In fact, one of the things, I, I, and I'm proposing, um, in regard of the dropout uh, age, it needs to be raised from 16 to 18. Many of our children right now, with the concern of the parent, your children could uh, be basically go to the street of New York at the age of 16. That is, is, it is unacceptable. They should be occupying the school. They should be different programs to keep the kids uh, basically um, motivated to continue on studying. And also one of the things I want to do, we had to concentrate in more vocational school because especially uh, on children among minority, they have a situation that sometimes they, they, they need to go to work right at the age of 18 because the parent, they go into financial struggle. So we have to make sure that this, those children that are mindset to actually go to the productive life at the age of 18, they have the choice, they have the opportunity to, to be uh, uh, prepared in a vocational school. So we have to definitely work in more vocational school and definitely our, in our school is a necessity, it's not a luxury. Mr. Salgado, thank you very much. I thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Which they closed down because it was underperforming. Mr. Loda, nice Republican candidate Joseph Loda. Nice, nice to meet you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Good evening. So, among the things that, uh, as as Funding for arts education in the schools, while the number of arts teachers has plateaued and has mm -hmm. not been severely reduced the last few years, in all the other metrics don't look so good. Uh, I am struck, as I've become an instant expert in arts education in New York City, by the, fa <laughs> by, by the fact of this, this supplemental arts funding that has seemed like a good thing introduced in, your in, in the Giuliani administration. Uh, the Bloomberg administration has decided, no, this 60-odd this million dollars doesn't need to be spent on arts. It's the principal's discretion. Should there be some fixed, should that be reverted to the way it was set up by the Giuliani administration? It should get even better because I think, in my view, arts education is critical to, I'm going to use the word core curriculum, but in a lowercase c in both cases. I do believe that arts, just to be careful for those... Um, Educational education. bureaucracy jokes no, going no. on here. Yes, I, uh. Thank you. Art and music education is critical to the formulation of young minds. And it shouldn't be a supplemental the way it was in the Giuliani administration. It should be part of the core. And uh, I really believe that. I do believe that, you know, it's, it's not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the ability, I mean, music itself, I actually believe I know numbers and math because of music. And they're, in, they're, they're intertwined. Um, in, in the, and there's art takes different forms, but I think it's really important to have a well-rounded person. It's mind, body, and soul is what we need to teach overall, and arts can have an impact so, on all three. So you're, it seems to be you're saying we should have as a fraction of the $20 billion we spend in the schools, a, a larger fraction than we currently spend, 1.5%, devoted to arts by, by law? No, by, by you know, uh, not necessarily by law, but, but at the request of the mayor and, and his chancellor. And so if it's... Requiring it to happen. And, but it should become part of... What, what's important to understand, I believe, about arts education um, is how critical it is. I mean, it's, it's a way in which you can understand history. It's a way in which you can understand, as I mentioned, math. It has connections to some other core programs, and you need to intertwine it. I mean, it's what I remember, and, I, and I, some, there are parts of it that I've never forgotten, and it's really important. But I'm really curious, and, and why I'm uh, repeating the question is, because you want to go beyond the supplemental arts funding to say, 
there's a fixed number. Do you have that in mind? If it's 300 million, 300. I don't have the number. It'd be an, it'd be bi a bigger number. But it'd be a bigger number, and it shouldn't be. It when you make it supplemental, you also make it the first thing to cut. I think when you cut arts education, you make a mistake. When you cut physical education, you make a mistake. You need to find a way to continue what I consider part of the core education program. And if you believe it's part of a core program, it does not get cut. You've got to find other ways to deal with whatever cuts are necessary. But don't take away things that I believe are essential to an education. As a, as a child, as a school kid, was there a moment, uh, an experience, uh, an aha <laughs> moment where, where, where some art class, music class, or other cultural experience sort of turned you on as you hadn't been turned on? <laughs> I think when I met Kathy McGuigan in finger painting in, in kindergarten was probably <laughs> the absolute correct answer to that specific question. But you didn't tweet her. <laughs> no, I did not tweet her. At the, no, I didn't. And and to, and today, as a cultural, <laughs> as an arts consumer, what what is what? Uh, I, I will try not to use verbs like turn on or excite. But <laughs> what what um, what are you most passionate about as a consumer of arts in New York City? Classical music. I love classical music. I always have. Um, and you know, I, I work for a guy who loved opera, and it pained me to listen to it. But I love the music more than I, I did the words, more than anything else. Uh, so I'm a big believer in, I, I love classical music. It's what both gets me charged up as well as calms me down. And the fact uh, that, that more than half of the schools in New York, that just this fact amazes me, do not have a full-time music teacher. Mm. Is, is, is that unacceptable? Yes, it's absolutely unacceptable. Now, when you, when you say half the number of schools, can you, can you break that down for me between grammar schools and high schools? I, I, I could, but in the simplified way that I've rendered this question on my things, I, I can't. No, I, I, but it's, I, I cannot. Um, uh, but it is, it is uh, well, for instance, uh, about, only about half hold concerts and recitals. Um, and, and, and more than 20%, again, I lumped them all together, mm -hmm. elementary, middle, and high school. Sure. Uh, should it be? Should every school in a Lota administration would every school have have a full-time arts teacher or a, or a full-time music teacher? We have. We've taken our high schools and we've broken them up into multiple schools. In some locations, they're co-located. These are public schools that are co-located. There may be a school for arts and a school for science combined with the school for automobile mechanics. And, and so within that confine of that building, there should be an arts teacher that could be able to share in those programs. If by chance you have someone who has decided to go away from the academic approach and go into automobile mechanics in high school, but has a desire or has the ability to take a course um, that's not part of their curriculum in some essentials or elemental uh, parts of music, they should be allowed to do that. The, um Support for the arts from the city, arts uh, and cultural institutions and nonprofits, has been in decline ever since Ed Koch left office. And he was uh, in office during a period of serious economic crisis, but mm -hmm. he still found the money. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were deputy uh, operate, what were you, deputy, deputy mayor for operations? Well, I was budget director before that, so I might have. So you were in a lot of conversations over mm -hmm. where money should be allocated. Mm -hmm. Was this a topic of discussion? I mean, we're, we're talking about a uh, pie in the sky idea of 1% of the city's overall right. budget going to arts institutions, despite the fact that they play such a major role in well, the city's economy. As Kurt had mentioned, in the Giuliani administration, right from the first year, the mayor coordinated with um, Schuyler Chapin, who's the late Schuyler yes, Chapin, who was the commissioner at the, at the Department of Cultural Affairs, to make sure that the schools started building their cultural programs up. Now, I don't know the specific numbers. I know them in the last like five or six years where they went down and now they're on the well, way I'm talking up. about the, the rest of the cultural programs. Like, you like the Metropolitan Opera. Well, you mm -hmm. don't like the Metropolitan Opera, but you like Well, Symphony. no, I like to go. I know. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there are big orchestras, there are small orchestras in the sure. city. Uh, there are small museums and big museums. There are big theater companies and mm -hmm. small theater companies, all dependent on uh, there are artists who are dependent mm -hmm. on, on the city for uh, keeping themselves alive. And the city has not been very helpful. 
I mean, you were involved with one of the uh, the more famous incidents, uh, the memorable incidents involving City Hall and the arts. Sure. But um, ask a question. <laughs> well, I'm sure you were waiting for it anyway. No, uh, the I, Brooklyn I get Museum. It. Right. You were really the uh, the the what word do I want to use? But you were point the point person. man on uh, the attacks on the Brooklyn Museum. Right. Uh, despite the Here. fact that so many of the things that were said seemed were inaccurate at the time. Well, let, let me let me go through the facts as I know them, but let me give you the conclusion. Um, I think I was um, I've learned a lot, and I made a mistake, but the following is absolutely true. Um, the court has held that once the city of New York gives money in an unrestricted way, it can no longer go back and go back and give restrictions. That's at the core of Judge Schindler's, Schindler's uh, ruling at the federal level. Um, I felt, others felt at the time, that city money should not be used, that the Brooklyn Museum should use some of its other monies, for which it had many, um, and lots of other monies to fund the program that actually had a, a painting of the Virgin Mary that included uh, elephant dung thrown on it. Not thrown, but it was... Well, no, no, Chris O'Feely, Chris, Chris O'Feely, Chris O'Feely, Chris O'Feely, the artist, uh, basically, as he described it, basically would throw it, and it wasn't put placed in a specific place as you were about to describe. That being said, uh, what I said both in court I said prior to, and I said in court, the role of the city is to allow an art museum to show whatever it wants. The role of the city is to be able to provide access and egress for anyone who wants to see it, and for those who want to protest it, push them off to the side and make sure that there's a place for them to do it. But at the time, I had thought, and I was held wrong, and now I know the difference, um, that you shouldn't be using uh, taxpayer dollars to desecrate one's religion. Well, what, the, the, so many uh, museums are on, on pr city property, property right. the, the Brooklyn Museum, Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Natural History, PS1. Uh, should the city be playing a role? No, in no, and they shouldn't, and that had no bearing whatsoever on the Brooklyn Museum case as well. So are the you willing to give 1% to the, Brooklyn... to the arts? Well, 1% to the arts would be $700 million. 1% of the city's budget would be 1% would be $700 million. It's currently $156 million. It would be a nice goal, but almost impossible to implement. The city budget is $70 billion. 1% of that would be $700 million. But well, let's not set the perfect against the bad. Between 150 right. and 700. It could be more. It could number? be more. If we could afford it, we should, we should set it as a target. What we should do is be able to break out that number. Well, I pointed out earlier that we seem to be able to afford incentives and tax breaks to many corporations that threaten to leave the city. Uh, the arts institutions find it hard to survive here. Why are we willing to let them go when we're not willing to let AIG I think the, go? I think, the, I think the incentive programs that have been put together for corporations, um, while I understand why, they've been structured in a flawed way. When a company says they're threatening to leave, and they guarantee that they're going to create X number of new jobs, there is no clawback provision in those contracts to say, if you do not achieve those numbers, the, uh, whatever the incentive is will be paid back immediately or over time. All contracts should have some level of clawback provision in there because the city gives away tax dollars, it should be, it, it, there is a people's stuff, those are the taxpayers' dollars. They should be as vigilant with those monies as they possibly can be, and they haven't been. I've said this publicly in various different um, forums, we've had numerous forums over the last couple of months, that incentive programs need to be constructed just the way a corporate contract is, and it should be a two-way street. You do what you're supposed to do, if you don't, we take it back. That being said, we should find the money for our cultural institutions. We have seen, look, look at it in a, in, a, in, a, in a much larger way, the way I look at the culturals. Um, they're critical to um, the lifeblood of New York, and they're critical to creating jobs. It's critical to allowing people to expand their, their focus on everything. Uh, it creates construction jobs, because all of these museums redo, and they're, most, and they're generally all union jobs. Stagehands uh, are involved in it as well. We need to look at it also from the point of view of why people come to visit New York. 
We're now up to 53 million visitors a year. You generally talk to most of them. They, they, they want to see the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then while they're there, they'll want to go off and they may want to go off and see PS1 in Queens. And, and actually, I believe most tourists look at our tourists, most tourists look at our, our uh, cultural institutions more than our lo locals. Not that it's a cultural, but you know, most New Yorkers never go to the Statue of Liberty. It's only tourists out to They help much create farther. that neighborhood now. The that's right, that's right. Just like they did in Soho and just like they did in Tribeca. We've run out of time, but thank you oh, so much, Jim. I'm Leonard. so sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Leonard. Nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Thanks Thanks. For, thank you all. Thank you. Democratic candidate, Bill de Blasio. Hello. Hi. How are you? You're generally considered the most liberal candidate here, at least on the Democratic side. So that means you would be willing to commit to a 1% <laughs> support of the arts. Very clever construct. <laughs> I give you a lot of credit. I, uh, it's true that I am liberal. I am, I am the most progressive candidate in the race. And I also want to say I am a, uh, a WNYC listener. So being on stage with Leonard Lopate, I'm getting kind of a, a thrill here. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, look, I, here's the reality. I think this is a city um, profoundly determined by our artistic and cultural life. Um, I think there's a lot we can do to protect and enhance it. But I also like to be, I am, I am a progressive, but I can count, and I like to be honest with people about the fact that we have a very serious problem in the next few years. I think this is gonna be a different discussion. I would like to believe in a year, even, or two. But with all of the city labor contracts open simultaneously. And um, fiscal challenges of a type we have not seen before. We have seen very profound fiscal challenges and deeper ones before, but we have not seen this particular problem of having every labor contract open at once and the challenges that creates. I have tried to consistently say on any major funding commitments that I don't feel comfortable making them. I do feel comfortable saying that there's a lot we can do in the here and now, and, and especially over a few years of build out, uh, to enhance uh, the cultural life of the city, whether you're talking about the plan I've put forward for a tax on the wealthy for early childhood education and after school, it's a tax on people who make a half million or more, and the after school component is a place where we can fundamentally reintroduce uh, arts and culture and music back in the public school system on a higher level. It's something we've basically started to lose uh, profoundly during the fiscal crisis of the 70s. I think the reintroduction begins with the after-school program I've proposed. I think we can do a lot more to protect uh, the cultural sector here, including a lot of artists, musicians, et cetera, who are not high income, which is the history of New York City. Creative people who brought their energy and creativity here but, but did not have a lot of resources. We used to have a real commitment to affordable housing for artists. I want to restore that as part of my affordable housing plan. <laughs> And I think even within the funding we have, we need to have a renewed uh, focus on fairness, which means we want to be more concerned about funding grassroots cultural organizations, cultural organizations in all five boroughs, <laughs> cultural organizations of every ethnicity, including representing some of the newer communities uh, ethnically in our city. So there's a lot we can do within it, but I can't yet get to that particular budgetary commitment. But well, we're in a situation now where the city depends on groups like uh, poets and writers and uh, other organizations that uh, rely on philanthropies to, to pay for pay their way. Uh, the, the city relies on those organizations to, to create arts education programs. Uh, the museums are there. I know we took class trips to all of the major museums when I was in school. I don't know if that happens as much today. But there's a lot of interaction between arts programs, artists. Uh, actors come into schools yes. and do things, and yet the city does practically nothing to support those artists who are being so generous to the city, both to the city's children and to the, the city in general. We are the, the arts capital of the world, and yet you'd never know it when you look at the city budget. I, I think we have to differentiate 
the aspirational piece, and I don't mean this to minimize the question at all. I want to be just blunt about it. We have to, we have to differentiate the aspirational piece from the next year or two. Aspirationally, I would like to, as a public school parent myself, as someone deeply concerned about education, I would like to fully reintegrate arts and culture and music into our public schools. I think that is crucial, not just for providing a well-rounded education. I think there's ample evidence um, that, that cultural education brings out part of a child's capacity, motivation, connection, uh, to the society around them that really deepens their ability to learn on many other levels. And um, I think this is something we, a place we have been in the past that we need to get to again. And it's a resource question. I'm, I'm not daunted by it. I think over time we can put together resources. So I differentiate that kind of vision from uh, what I think we can do in the here and the now. And I think two pieces are front and center in my vision. The, the tax on the wealthy for the after-school plan, because if we're going to provide after-school for every middle school child who needs it in this city, that's my plan. Um, I am convinced that the way after-school works, you need uh, uh, an arts and culture element and you need a recreation element to make the whole thing work, the tutoring and the homework help and everything else work. So it's a natural growth area. And then again, the affordable housing piece, my plan, 200,000 units over 10 years. It's a very different approach than the Bloomberg approach. It is predicated upon uh, requiring the real estate industry to create affordable housing using the power of this city government and, and all that we control and all that the real estate industry needs of us to be able to do its work and make its profit, um, raising the bar on what we need back as a public sector. But again, within that, recognizing that, that artist housing, uh, you know, housing for the cultural sector was profoundly positive and productive for the city and we have to start down that road again. So I know some of the things we can do in the short term. I know aspirationally I want to see our schools fully integrate arts and culture. I know that the law says even now that there's a level of cultural education that's supposed to be provided and is constantly ignored by the city of New York, and I would not ignore that. I would at least let us get, make sure we get to that baseline right now. But I think the vision you're talking about, which is a good one, uh, is still a few years away. It's interesting, though, when you say you, what you just said is that you would get to the baseline that's required by law. Well that would be an expensive get baseline to get to, wouldn't it? And, and therefore, despite this, this unprecedented next two years of the open labor contracts, you'd have to shift a substantial number of tens or perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars into the arts education budget of the Department of Education. Well, there's a, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, of course, here, here's the first conundrum. The law is the law. We don't, it's not optional. It has uh, been. It, it has been, but it's... <laughs> it's <laughs> I know we're jaded New Yorkers, but it's actually not supposed to be optional. The law is the law. Um, uh, one, two, what's happened is, and I understand the, the challenges principals face. They end up in, a, in a, a really tough situation with a budget that they now have more autonomy to control, you know, with the joys and sorrows of that process. You know, robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and uh, arts education is the loser in the equation. Well, again, the law is the law, and I think my approach would be to say to principals that we have to fulfill this mandate. Uh, we're going to work with you at City Hall and at the Tweed Building to provide any kind of support and relief we can, but we have to fulfill this mandate. Maybe there's some creative ways to do it, working with nonprofits and you know, other outside groups. But you just can't take it lightly, not just because, I mean, one, because it's law, but two, because, again, as a parent, I have seen the multiplier effect. Now, I'm going to embarrass my son, Dante, is that you over there? Where is he? My son, Dante, is sitting over there. You can see from his hair. Uh, and you've named him after a writer. And I named him after a writer, the greatest of writers. But I would, Dante went to MS-51 in Brooklyn, like his sister, Kiara, they were in a drama program. And they may deny it now, but it, it has uh, shown in many ways since, at the middle school level, to be in a drama-centered program, I think brought out in them a lot of other capacity. Uh, obviously, we could start with public speaking, uh, at which Dante excels, but we could talk about you know, uh, confidence and presentation and, and a sort of thoughtfulness about uh, how to prepare. And a lot came out of it that was sort of life skills, not just enhancement of the rest of education, but, but life skills, you could argue. So I understand the power of it, 
So the law first, but also I think there's a great multiplier effect. I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I, I'm interested in what, you're, what I think you're saying about following the law, which seems to, in, in terms of how much you have to dedicate, how many classes in all, all the various major arts realms you have to have and all, all, so forth. I think you're saying if the, if the education budget pie is pretty much set and we're not gonna expand that, other pieces, other pieces of that pie are gonna have to be trimmed off to make that arts slice bigger. Oh, and we have to make the art slice complement the other pieces better because I do think there's a natural complement. I don't think the arts requirement is exactly massive right now. Let's be clear. It's the law, but I don't think it is a, uh, calling for the kind of pervasiveness a lot of us would like to see. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a level we can attain in the short term. I think we're obligated to. Can I jump in just for a moment with a follow-up? Please. You worked for Mayor Dinkins. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were a staffer and then became assistant for community affairs at City Hall. Didn't the Dinkins administration cut funding for the arts from the higher levels that have been provided by the Koch administration? Well, I can't speak to everything uh, that the administration did, but I can tell but that you that... that is a past record. No, uh, again, I didn't happen to be the person who got oh. to make that decision is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but I can... I can uh, <laughs> wouldn't that have been nice? But... Uh, I think the fact is, no, there's no question, it's been a steady pattern of cut. But I guess, I think that, I'm gonna just editorialize here, I think the purpose of this forum, rightfully, is to force candidates to think about the issue and take their initial stances and then think about you know, where we need to go from there. I'm trying to be straightforward about, I'm not trying to give the pandering answer uh, in the first instance, but I am trying to signal that I get what the potential is here. I get what the meaning is here. I get what we would, how we would benefit. I think we'll take a series of steps. Now, you could argue that we are on the verge of a golden age for all we know. You know, the economy's beginning to improve. Real estate values are, are at an extraordinary level. Maybe we're gonna get through a year or two of rough sailing fiscally and then end up in a good place. Maybe we're not. I, I never go to sleep at night assuming it's going to be a gloriful time. But I think these questions to some extent will be determined by the state of our city economy and what kind of revenue we bring in. In a good revenue dynamic, this would be, to me, a priority because I understand both you know, morally, essentially what it means to the city, but also the kind of multiplier effect it could have, particularly in our schools. Bill de Blasio, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, an, it's an assembly line. Of <laughs> But he's absolutely right. One of the uh, not been discussed in pretty much any of the other forums uh, that where the candidates have had to talk about the big issues, and yet this is so important. Or as we did both discovered looking on the respective campaign websites, it's not much discussed on those either. Not at uh, all. Our next candidate is Democratic candidate Randy Credico. Hi. If I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Hello, how are you? Hello. Randy Credico, that's it. It's perfect. You're the first person to get that right. Credico, 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 you know, it's, uh, they're all over the map with it, but you got it right. Good. This I is figured a very... it was like credit card. Well, it is. Yeah. It um, is like a credit card. Credit I owe a company. lot of money, you know? Big uh, credit card debts. So you have said in the past that you, you think that the Board of Education, in fact, uh, should have artists and, and, and filmmakers and theater directors on it. Uh, why? Well, because uh, why not? You know, look who you have right now. You have, um, well, with the education department, you got this guy, uh, what, uh, Walcott, uh, and he's a tool of the, whatever. He's a tool of the, uh, you know, of, of like the special interests. You need people in there like Cornell West, I would have as the head of the education department. That's who you need. You need some creative people in there. You have such stodgy, dull people that are running these departments, and they're all coming from the private sector. And so we need to replace that with people that have energy, that, are, that have ideas, that have a creative background like me. All right? I have a creative background. I've been in show business for 40 years. 40 years in show business. I started out in 72 when I was 18 years old. You know, I do impressions. I noticed that you played with red buttons in Reno on your website, for instance. How did you know that? I studied. I did play with red buttons, and it's because of red buttons that I'm even in New York. I was working with him and a fellow by the name of um, 
of, uh, he was in those Preston Sturgis films. Uh, can't think of his name right now, but he was a big Kino player. But Red and I were very close. He's an old- Not Harold Lloyd. Huh? Right? Not Harold, no, not Harold Lloyd. No, no. <laughs> Ishka Bibble. No, so it was, um, Eddie Bracken, uh -huh. Eddie Bracken, okay, great guy, very conservative. He was very close with Reagan. Reagan and Bracken and Nancy Reagan loved each other, and they used to have all these great conversations, and, and Red would get all upset, because he, he and I were watching the, um, yes, I do a lot of them, you haven't seen nothing yet. We gotta liven this place up a little bit, man. You know, after I'm waiting you're for You're the Bloomberg. only two, the only two who are not running for mayor in this city are sitting right here, all right? <laughs> So, but Red and I were watching uh, the convention uh, here in 1980 when it was Jim Acotta against Ted Kennedy, and uh, that speech really inspired Red and me, right? We're watching Ted Kennedy said, and for those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. So, Red and I were, you remember that speech? Red and I were like, wow. And then a couple of months later, Reagan won. And... Uh, Red and I went out and got drunk at a place called La Fonda, a Mexican restaurant in Reno. Drank a lot of margaritas, great guy, and he says, well, let's see if they pull the rope, the Reagan administration. Then I saw him at George Burns', I'm a big name dropper today, George Burns' 90th birthday party where he had the worst cigars on the cake. Um, 90th birthday, he had the worst cigars. And um, I said, Red, did they pull the rope? He said, yes, they pulled the rope. And, um, and so, but he said, go to New York. So I came to New York City in 1980. I was just doing impressions back then, of political impressions. I was doing Nixon and that kind of stuff. And so I, uh, and I did a lot of great showbiz impressions too, like Jack Nicholson, I did him. You know what I mean? Because I know you guys want to hear the truth tonight. All right. Now I'm hesitant to cut you off. However, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Come on, I'm on a roll. You know what well, I mean? What about support in the schools? All right, let's Arts go to the schools. schools. But, but yeah. it seems like you are a person probably who, even as a kid, if, if I could imagine, didn't need much uh, push to express your creativity. No. <laughs> um, well, you know, my father, I grew up, that's true. But let me go on with go my ahead. question, if I might, just for a second. Uh, well, I mean, we're, we're now spending 1.5% of our, of our education budget on all the theater, dance, music, paintings, film, all of it. What, what should that be? Um, what it should be, it should be, what are our priorities here first? There are 57,000 homeless people in New York City, all right? There are 22,000 homeless children in New York City. That's the conversation I first think about. There are 60,000 people in jails in New York State. Rikers is a joke. I've been arrested six times over at Occupy Wall Street and fighting against stop and frisk. And the arts, of course, are very important. We have to have it. We must have, we must subsidize, but not by raising money the way we're doing it with these Mickey Mouse lotto games, uh, raising money with cigarette taxes. It all is re a regressive tax plan that we have. If we were to tax Wall Street a half a percent sales tax, we could fund everything in this city, a half a percent, and no one else, that's it. And it's something that's picking up steam around the country, taxing Wall Street. They're not paying their fair share of taxes. They're living a great life down there. And believe me, they're bankrolling a lot of the campaigns that you're seeing, not mine. They won't give me a nickel, all right? <laughs> So they're bankrolling the campaigns. You got guys like Al D'Amato, who's down there flacking for the uh, et cetera, you know? So you got him, and, uh, and so they're getting the money, and you got a lot of Democrats that are really like old, what they used to call them, dough-faced Democrats from the 1850s. They're really like centrists, you know what I mean? They're centrist Democrats. We need a real, loud, progressive voice right now. After 20 years of thuggish rule by Giuliani and 12 years of imperial rule by a modern-day Louis Napoleon, Bonaparte, <laughs> all right? the hospitalization of this city, all right? And they still are gutting programs that are, I mean, look, I ran a 501c3, the William Moses Kunstler Fund for Racial Justice for 15 years at the same time that I was in show business. So I know how important it is to get funding, how difficult it is. And the, you know, I got five minutes left. Five no, minutes no, left. no, that no. means we have five minutes. Oh, you have five minutes left. <laughs> no, but no, don't you want to say something well, though? you're talking in my five minutes. Five and I, minutes. And I, I'm wondering uh, whether 
you think that we should find more funding for comedy clubs? Um, <laughs> yeah, I could use the work. You know, I got my first residual in like two months. Look at this from, from doing a show called My Name is Earl. This is my big residual check from AFTRA, $23, all right? Yes. But I, I know, we're members of AFTRA. I know, it's, a, it's a fine union. <laughs> but conservative, though, right? But I must tell you, it's a SAG, actually. Um, <laughs> But I must tell you that uh, there's plenty of money out there. And we should have, with all due respect to Columbia University, they're not paying their fair share of taxes with some of the buildings. Well, I'm serious. You know, it's great that they're well endowed here, all right? But, you know, there are some things that they have. There are some buildings that they have that, you know, they may want to pay some taxes on. And the same with NYU. I'm sorry, really. Uh, but um, I know you see, I, when you see candidates here, when the issue is parochial, the candidates are Pinocchio, all right? They will say whatever they have to say to mollify the crowd. I am very blunt, all right? And I will say exactly what's on my mind. We could have a progressive real estate tax in this city. I'm sorry, you want to get it's to something okay. else. Randy, um, you know, I had this crowd eating out of my hands until I mentioned Columbia. I was joking about that. All right. <laughs> there have actually been comedians who have run for political office and one in other parts of the world. I think uh, Reykjavik has one or, or had one. The big problem they ran into is that uh, they then had to deal with real life right. government. And you're, you're, what you're saying is, I mean, I, I think you're the first person who might very well commit to a full 1% for the arts of yes. all of the people who are here. All the others have kind of, well, well I I'm would. not ready to make a commitment, but. Well, I am. I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm a, I'm a performer. I know how important it is to have. You know, France, uh, leading up to their revolution, they suppressed all of the art out there. It got through, and seriously, they didn't want uh, Voltaire, all of that stuff was suppressed. All right, you need to have the expression of art to, in all forms, all forms. I mean, we don't want they, what they had in Germany where, you know, they didn't give money to Fritz Lang, but they gave money to uh, Emil Jennings, you know. I'm not talking about that. I mean, it can get dangerous, too. You Emil Jennings was a good actor. He was a good actor, but he was also a uh, pro, uh, you know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the question is, I commit to 2%. Do you really think that you 2%, gonna... all right? All right. <laughs> Two. And, and for those keeping score, that's $1.4 billion. <laughs> well, we need it. We need it. We need to. My God, it's been a nightmare. I was around in the 60s. I used to listen to you on WBAI. And I was around in the 60s. You were up 70s. that late? Uh -huh. I, I was on David Rothenberg's show yesterday, yeah. by the way, or Saturday. So being on the couch next to you since I didn't get the Johnny Carson couch. <laughs> I did Carson's show, and I didn't get the couch. All right? But I got the couch today, and this is really exciting for me to get the couch because uh, I'm a big fan of yours. And by the way, how come I'm not on Brian Lehrer's show? You're asking me why we're Brian giving has money. To, we are taxpayers are giving money to the Brian Lehrer show, right? Well, why not have me on? I can't answer that All question. Right. Well, I, have, I have my own problems. I know. Well, I'm trying to get on your show too. You know. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you that. Yeah, but we will be discussing what all the candidates said on my show in a few days. Oh, yeah? And I, I suspect we'll have one or two little clips from your visit here. Can I do my lawyer arm? Yeah. Can I do my, listen, can I close since I got one minute left? I, I got to close with like Louis Armstrong or something, right? Go ahead. Would you like that, folks, huh? A man who lived in Queens for many well, years. Well, Louis Armstrong buried out in Brooklyn, isn't he? Huh? No. He's not buried out in Brooklyn. But anyway, I, my father owned a huge nightclub, a huge nightclub. He ran it uh, in Ontario, California. Louis Armstrong worked there. Bobby Darren worked there. Uh, Stuff Smith, uh, uh, Ray Charles. Uh, everyone, James Brown, and I used to, I grew up watching that, and so that was really my first voice. I, Louis would be in the back room, he came to the house, we had barbecues, and he'd be smoking what he called weeds, you know, it was weeds. He was a big pot smoker. I smoked pot occasionally too, all right? But you didn't inhale. I inhale. Oh. I love it, man. It's much better than drinking, all right? But here it is. Give me a kiss to build a dream on, and my imagination will live upon that kiss. How was that, all right? Great, Randy. Randy Credico, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good Pleasure. luck. Thank you. Thank you. What a crowd. What a crowd. What a crowd. <laughs> okay. I forgot who and started it. And you thought a mayoral forum might be boring, okay? <laughs> I forgot whose turn it is. 
I don't know. Uh, but our <laughs> next our next candidate is the Honorable John Liu. Okay. You go first. I go first? Why not? Okay. Sure. John Liu, nice to see you. So, Mr. Liu. Oh, that's going to be a tough yeah. act to follow, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's a dog coming on, too. <laughs> um, right, right, right. Um, I, I, I've seen you say uh, that as a quantitative guy, as a trained actuary and so forth, that, that you actually looked as a student at the arts uh, uh, to, to balance out your, your total math nerd side. Is that right? <laughs> Look, I, I, I have spent my life trying to dispel Asian American stereotypes, but I'm pretty good with the numbers. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, you know, being a mathematical physics major does not help dispel the stereotype, at least in my case. Uh, so, look, I, I, I generally have been a math and science guy pretty much my whole life. Uh, even today, I'm, I'm very much focused on the numbers, the sciences, and, and analysis. But when I was growing up, I did see, I did have my fair share of arts and music education. I had violin lessons in class. I had lots of art history as well. And, and beyond that, of course, to, well, to round out our educational complement today, we also need more physical education, which actually was my favorite subject, gym. But uh, now being the, the, the father of a, uh, someone who, Joey, who just finished the seventh grade and is going on to the eighth grade, he had, I don't think he has had enough arts and music education. In fact, many of his years in school, large parts of the year has, have been spent on getting ready for the big tests in the spring. And I think the problem is that they don't have tests in arts or, science, or, or math, I'm sorry, arts or music. Otherwise, they might have had more classes just to, uh, just to get the kids ready for those tests. So uh, in, the, in recent years, it's just become too much about these standardized tests. And anything that didn't gear kids up towards taking them fell by the wayside. And unfortunately, I think more arts and music have just been sacrificed far too much. I think that's clear. And then so as mayor, how do you tweak the system to make that not so? You're still going to have tests. You're still going to have accountability. You're still going to have all that thing. So what do you do to make sure the funding for art, music, and the rest gets its, its fair share if it's because, as you say, it can't be standardized, tested? Right. Uh, so, so first you start with a significant reform of the school system itself. I think that the main problem that's wrong with the school system right now is that we run our schools and classrooms as if they are business divisions reporting up to a DOE corporation. It's all about accountability, accountability, and more accountability. Numbers and statistics that have to be constantly reported up to a corporate headquarters at the Tweed building. And it's just lost a sense of learning environment in our classrooms. We need to restore. We need to restore a holistic learning environment, and that starts with having an, a, somebody who has a background in education as chancellor for our school system, as opposed, to, as opposed to the three chancellors under the current mayor who have all been in violation of state law, because state law actually requires uh, a, a, an educational background for the chancellor. Then you, you allow our professionals, our educational professionals, to do their job, to let teachers teach, let principals lead, and make sure that, that the, the, the environment is for learning, not about churning out numbers. And so once you restore that kind of environment, uh, once you restore that kind of environment, you're able to really start looking at education itself, as opposed to numbers at the end of the day. Our schools are not factories. Our teachers are not assembly line, line workers. Our kids are not widgets coming off of that assembly line. They are individuals that need well-rounded education. And under my plan of educational reform, we are going to ch achieve a system that focuses on learning, not test taking. Now, I'm not saying that we're getting rid of standardized tests. I do believe that at the end of the day, we still need standardized tests. But it's a question of what you do with those results. I mean, nowadays, it's not the results of tests aren't used simply to gauge the student's progress or achievement. They are used to make decisions about whether to close entire schools 
for a number of years, monetary bonuses were paid based on those test scores. And so you had a very highly leveraged situation where the, the, invent, the, the perverse incentives existed. No matter how much you tried to guard against it, there was always going to be some pressure to get the kids to do better and better and better on the test scores, even if it didn't really mean that they, they were learning better. So the reduction in the emphasis of what you do with those test scores, I think, will help restore that learning environment and then allow us to focus on the well-rounded education, specifically with arts, music, and physical education. And where do you get money from that? There's, there is plenty of money in the school system. It's one-third of our city's budget, $23 billion a year. And what I would do to get rid of some, uh, what I would get rid of to free up some of that funding to provide arts and music education, which I do believe is critical. It is critical. It actually inspires people, it inspires kids to go to class. Kids aren't always going to class for math and, and reading. They are going to class because there are fun subjects and arts and music have always been among the fun subjects. And, and so- And right now we're spending one and a half percent of that 23 billion uh, on, on arts uh, education generally defined, broadly defined, at the end of your first term in office, what would that be? If not one and a half percent, two percent, three percent? Well, it, it will be more. And the way we're going to get that money is to get away from the Department of Education's current mindset. Uh, I, I am a believer that the Department of Education should engage all its stakeholders. That means engaging teachers, principals, parents, and community activists. Right now, the, mo the model for the Department of Education is if they need advice or they need more information to fill some kind of knowledge gap, they don't go to any stakeholders. They go nationally and find the most expensive consultants around to bring them to New York City to then help, help them fashion the solutions and wind up paying. I mean, the, the contract budget, the consultant budget for the Department of Education is now approaching a billion dollars a year. That's a lot of consultants. And as my audits have shown, we have seen a huge amount of waste. Wasted money in, in programs, in systems like ARIS, which was supposed to, according to Chancellor Klein's own words, revolutionize education in New York City. It turned into a system that nobody wanted to use. Uh, $80 million there, $67 million for another system that has not worked, the, uh, the uh, Special Education Student Information System. So there are all these systems that have been created by these consultants that are not, not worth the, barely worth the paper they're, they're written on. So, uh, so there's plenty of funding that's available to be freed up to prioritize for arts and music education. And to answer your question, at the, at the, in, in year one of my administration, we would certainly see a return to much of the arts and music education. And it wouldn't be necessarily just in the classrooms. I would, I look to partner with some of the cultural organizations and institutions that we have. We have tremendous world-renowned cultural groups, cultural organizations right here in New York City. When I was a kid, young audiences is something that I'm very familiar with. We used to go to performances and concerts with our young audiences. That's an example of an organization that we should nurture with city funding and allow them to partner with public schools to get kids the kind of well-rounded education that they deserve. Well, and in fact, those partnerships of schools with, with cultural outside cultural organizations have increased in number a lot. Huge majorities of schools now have them. Meanwhile, the funding, those aren't free. It sounds like a free way right. to get well, that's education why I said, back in school. Sub, that's funding why I said support it with city funding, those organizations. Yes. Support it with city funding. Now, you mentioned the Tweed Building, and that reminded me that it was originally proposed as a museum. Uh, museums <laughs> were proposed for the, the uh, World Trade Center area. Uh, all of them are gone uh, for one reason or another. Uh, and, and that's partly because the city didn't fight for them and the city didn't allocate money for them. Uh, what uh, would you, uh, you, you have the control, I don't know how much power you have to actually allocate funds for one thing rather than another. But as mayor, I'm going to ask you that question. I've asked others, can you envision allocating 1% of the city's budget to supporting the nonprofit arts institutions, all those different ones that you've just referred to, uh, to keep them alive and vibrant in this city? So uh, I, as controller, even though I am the chief financial officer, 
I'm not part of the budgetary process. That's between the city council and the mayor. And if I start allocating funds to this organization or that group, I think the mayor will sue me once again. So uh, what, what, what we- He's not your friend? What was that? Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say uh, I'm not his favorite person. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think to, to answer your, your bigger question, uh, I, I, I can't. I'm not in a position to say we should have X percentage of our city budget for this purpose or that purpose, even if it's to say 1% for the cultural organizations in New York City. I, I will tell you, though, that I believe that under my administration, the funding for arts and music and cultural organizations will be significantly increased. And, and I do have to say that I would start by increasing the funding for uh, I would say the lesser established organizations, the new, newer organizations, many of them in the neighborhoods, in, in immigrant communities, those out of the mainstream. This is where we nurture the talent, the skills of the eight and a half million people that we have here in New York City. It's, you know, the, the Metropolitans and the Museum of Natural History and the Guggenheims, great. And, and my wife and I, we go with our son Joey quite a bit to, to these organizations. But we, you nurture the talent from some of the smaller organizations who are run on shoestring budgets. I think to the extent that we can assist them more with city funding, it not only is better for, uh, for the artists and the performers involved, it actually makes for a much better and stronger fabric of the city. And it has economic benefits as well. So at the end of the day, I do believe that this kind of funding is a good investment. Can we think of them as small businesses that have to be nurtured and supported? In many cases, I mean, the ones uh, you're talking about? I think, I think that the reason why I wouldn't call them I mean, the city helps small, startups. They, they, it we helps. should help them, we should consider them as startups. But once you consider them small businesses that you see, you, you have a whole new standard that's being imposed. I mean, some of these organizations, I, I actually am a believer that we should give them a little bit of latitude because they don't, you know, some of these organizations are not going to be the best in terms of making sure the spreadsheets are completely functioning. And, and so you do need to give them a little bit of leeway. Uh, they're not going to be as accountable. As you a, are so not an accountant. And I mean, the leeway, I, leeway to the I am not audience? an accountant, believe it or not. I, I am professionally, uh, and, from, and this is what makes an me actuary, different right? from the rest of my rivals. I, I've spent most of my adult career in the private sector. And yes, I am an actuary, which is just like an accountant minus the personality. Uh, <laughs> John Liu, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Doce. Sure, sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And we will now take a break. Jack. Hi, good to meet you. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm going to ask you the question that uh, pretty much everybody else has avoided answering. Excellent, I'm ready. Would you be willing to allocate 1% of the city budget to support of independent arts organizations, the, the nonprofits that are so important to the city's economy? I do think we can get to 1%, yes. And let me tell you how we get there. First of all, let me say it's great to be here at Teachers College. 20 years ago, I studied art and painting in this building, <laughs> right in this building. Um, I studied at Columbia, went on to NIH, I studied with Ursula Kirk, a professor at Teachers College. And maybe people remember her. She's now passed on. So it's wonderful to be back, be back home. How do we get to 1%? Our budget in New York City is $68 billion. $68 billion. That's $680 million that we're talking about. Currently, we spend about $150 million. So how do we get there? Being a business person, being somebody who grew up in Brooklyn, from small businesses, creating businesses. This is something I know about. I served as a trustee on the Citizens Budget Commission. It's the number one watchdog of the New York City and New York State budget. And so I know something specifically about our city budget. And here's what I can tell you. We spend $150 million right now on arts. But guess what? Arts is economic development. 
When you look at the revival of neighborhoods, that's about arts. When you invest in art, in neighborhood after neighborhood, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in other parts of the city, you revive neighborhoods. You attract tourists. You invest in kids and teachers. This brings up our economy. So when I look and say, how do we get to the $680 million number? I say, yes, we can do that. First, in the city budget itself, we can get to $300 million. And then I believe in a public-private partnership, we can bring in another $350, $400 million to get to the $680 million number. I think it is doable, and as mayor, I will do that. Can we <laughs> expect you to do something to help artists survive? For example, artists made Soho into an area that they can no longer afford. They did the same thing with Tribeca. They're now being priced out of Williamsburg uh, into Greenpoint and being priced out of Greenpoint into Bushwick, uh, which is having other kinds of effects on those neighborhoods which we don't even want to get into, the gentrification aspect. But all of those neighborhoods have been revived. Uh, they are doing wonderful business. And yet, we are treating the artists who are so responsible for it as though they are really just an afterthought. Sure. When you look at New York City, it's not all uniform right now. If you look at economic development, as you pointed out, there's areas of great economic development. There's other areas that have left, been left behind. I was born in Brookdale Hospital in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Go back there right now. It's still a depressed area right now. It was years ago when I was born there, a few years ago, and it's still now. Well, so bring some artists in there and the whole thing will change. <laughs> Well, right into the hospital, by the way. And we then, need that then, in the hospital. And then Bloomberg will start new construction and right. uh, the neighborhood well, will change. Here's specifically, I think, what we can do. Rather than just hand-waving and saying that let's bring art in, here's what we can do. Look at the revival right now in Flatiron, in downtown New York, in downtown Brooklyn, with some of the shared office spaces that tech companies, for example, are taking over. Tech companies want to collaborate together. They want to be together. They're sharing these office spaces, and it's one of the hottest trends right now driving New York City. Well, guess what? Many artists want to do the same. But we haven't provided them those kind of spaces. When you look, if, if people have been here to the new, renewed Museum of Arts and Design, MAD, on Columbus Circle, right? Uh, you may remember the old design with no windows whatsoever. Now, of course, it's been redesigned. On the sixth and seventh floor, what do you find there? Has anyone been there? Sixth and seventh floor. What do you find? Studios. Studios, exactly. And so having artists working together in studios, they love that. They want that. They want to open their studios and have people come and visit them. Well, we can do that same thing in all five boroughs. We can take it to Brownsville, to the parts of Brooklyn where I grew up. I grew up on Ocean Parkway and Kings Highway near Coney Island. You don't find huge artist communities there right now. Let's make it easy by creating these shared collaboration workspaces. It's worked in other sectors, not just in tech, but in design and other places as well. We are the art capital of the world the art capital of the world. We need to invest in that. This is what is driving our economy. We need to invest in making this happen, but again, not just in a few parts of the city, but in all five boroughs. How does a city like Chicago, which is stressed economically, uh, do so well in creating public art, for example? Well, it's a question of priorities. It's a question of priorities. And let me tell you that it starts at the young age. I was really lucky. Uh, at the age of seven years old, I found out something called Suzuki. Anyone here have a Suzuki kid or learn Suzuki as a child music? It was a great way to learn music, a fantastic way to learn music. And so um, when I was, you know, I benefited the fact that my school was offering Suzuki, but the fact is too many schools don't have that. A third of our schools don't have art teachers. More than half of our schools don't have music teachers. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. And the question now is, how can we actually find that? So you, again, you look at, at, at cities like Chicago, other cities, they're investing in these kinds of projects because they know that it is a priority that not only create creativity for the kids, nourish the creativity for the kids, but benefit the city as a whole. Well, Kurt, uh, he stole your statistics. Uh, he, uh, he, he, Sorry. He's, he's <laughs> read the same briefing papers I have, I guess. But I, I am interested in, in given that, I, and I don't want to, unfairly cast you as something, but to some degree, I think you're being cast as the, the, a Bloombergian, uh, socially liberal. With Suzuki training. Okay, there you go. With Suzuki so, so you, For all training. I know, he can play now, the violin. Now, but, we're concerned about politicians fiddling around, so just ah, watch it. Good. Um, 
but while while and and he is clearly in in his in many ways a great arts philanthropist, somebody who cares about arts. But interestingly and oddly and somewhat disturbingly, in the last his last two terms, really, the the, the funding for arts education has has been at best holding steady and in some way shockingly diminished. The, the, the budget for, here's a, here's a number, the budget for all art supplies, musical instruments, everything, has been cut to about $2 per kid per year. Per year, yep. Down, uh, down from $65, where it used to be just so, about 10 years ago. So you've, you've committed to, to, to Leonard's proposal uh, to doubling, essentially, the public monies. For, I think I'm the first right now in this audience. For, for supporting a nonprofit cultural organization. Thank you. What do you do, what and how do you make sure there's a steady stream of financial support for arts education? Because it's always, and we're, we've seen in the last 10 years, the easiest to cut. Yeah. Well, it's the easiest to cut if you have the wrong priorities. It's the easiest to cut if that's not your priority. We did have $65 a student just 10 years ago. We are down to $2 a student. The question now is, what do we do about that? You just wave your hand and say, oh, I'm going to restore $65 million. Where's it going to come from? Let's take a step back a second. We are now teaching our kids right now in K through 12 in a system, in a program that goes back to the 18th century, maybe the 17th century. And I can tell you as somebody who's not only created businesses, created jobs, but also one of the companies I help grow is a company that connects people with jobs. I can tell you from that experience, the job market of today is not just looking for, oh, this guy got 100 on this and that, and this young lady got 100 on this and that. That's not what is required and looked for in today's market. It is creativity, it is problem solving, and team-based work. And let's look at Eastside Community. Eastside Community is a public school in New York City, First Avenue and 11th Street. It's a school where you will not find 30 kids lined up listening to a teacher lecturing. What you will find are kids working in small teams, working on portfolios of projects, and then three, four adults like ourselves come in every three months and listen to the kids and give them constructive feedback from the sixth grade on to 12th grade. Can you imagine how these kids are now so prepared for, for their, their job ready, their college ready, their life ready? They're ready for the kind of problem solving that we need in today's economy. Some say, Jack, you're a technologist. You're, you were trained as a neuroscientist. What about science and things like that? Yes, science is important. And people say that science, tech, engineering, and math, STEM, as they say, is going to be a key driver. And it is. But guess what's missing in STEM? A, STEAM. STEAM is what's going to drive the engine. STEAM is what's going to drive. And, and it's not just an acronym. It really isn't. I can tell you, what kind of person do you want doing the medical breakthroughs, um, being able to go into law or architecture, and, and being the next Frank Geary? Somebody who, yes, maybe has some technical knowledge, but has the arts and has been nurtured in terms of creativity. That is absolutely part and parcel. So you ask me now, how do you get from $2 back to 65 and maybe beyond that? It is by relooking at the entire paradigm we have of the focus on testing. The other candidates in this race have been career politicians, most of them, most of them, for many years now. They've had their chance to change the system, and they have not. They have not. They've been complicit in building a system that is teaching for the test again and again. Well, guess what? Let's teach for the real world, not the test. Let's teach for it. Because I, I can tell you, there's no one hiring anyone who said, oh, he was taught for the math test and he did well, so let's hire that person. What people are looking for now at Google, Google has a campus right now, a tech company has a campus of 3,000 people. I serve on the board of Google X Labs, the most creative part of Google, the one creating the self-driving car and the crazy Google glasses and things like that. Well, guess what? They're looking for creativity, for arts. That's what they're looking for. And when you look at the testing apparatus we've implemented in our school, it is tens of millions of dollars. We can restore $65 million within two years. We can do that quickly. And we can do that because we're going to reprioritize. We don't have to find other money and bring that in. We can look at the $25 billion total budget, $17 billion budget, core for students within our New York City budget, and we can reallocate from the over-focus on testing and reallocate towards the arts. The arts are not just about, oh, it's a nice after-school kind of thing. It is core and part and parcel. And when you go to Soundview, thank you. 
please visit Soundview Academy in the Bronx, a school, a public school in New York City. What are those kids doing from sixth to eighth grade? They're working in small teams to create films, to create new kinds of media. And what are those kids doing this summer, right now? They're on film crews, real film crews in New York City, participating in the arts economy of New York City. The $400 million that is brought to New York City from the film and TV office. That is a fantastic melding of the kind of education I'm talking about. Other candidates have had their chance. They've been career politicians, they've had their chance. It is time to reconnect our K through 12 with reality. And the reality is we're not in the 18th century anymore. We're in a century that, val I'm sorry, um, we're in a century that values problem solving, team-based work, and creativity. That is the kind of thing that the arts nurtures. So three-point program. First, arts must be on every school's progress report card. It must be there because otherwise you're not incentivizing the principal and of course they're going to react to those incentives. You cannot blame principals if you do not put it on the progress report code that you see on the web for every single school. Number two, a five-week minimum music experience course for every kid sixth grade and above. How, again, how do we pay for it? By this reallocation that I was mentioning before. These are the kinds of things, and then again, of course, restoring ourselves to $65 million, that will pay for art teachers in every school, and it will also pay for art partnerships. Out of 1,700 schools in our system today, 300 do not have a partnership today with a museum or cultural institution. We must address that. One of the, if you ask any adult, ask an adult, what are the experiences you remember from K through 12? They'll remember generally two things. I dissected a guinea pig or frog, and I went on an outing. I remember, for example, as a kid, we were lucky enough to go behind the scenes at the Met Opera. Has anyone seen the crazy elevator at the Met Opera that brings up the sets and down? Okay, it's unbelievable what that does. And I remember that, that was in fifth grade. And I clearly remember that because of the impression it made in that experiential learning. That's the kind of paradigm that connects with the kind of people I've trained, I've hired, and the kind of companies I've built but also as somebody who comes from a family that highly values the arts, it was clear to me from an early, early stage that having the arts as part of our economy drives our economy. It is not a distraction. It is not just a public piece of sculpture out there. It is what drives New York City. We are the creative capital of the world, and to do so, and to continue to do so, we must invest in that. Well, you haven't been a lifelong politician, but you're very good at it so far, Jack. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we usually like to present the other side of an argument. He just uh, derided 18th century politicians. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a Tea Party candidate here tonight, unfortunately. So, uh, Mr. McDonald, um, every, people, lots of people have said they're, they're the only person in the private sector. You, too, have been in the private sector before uh, you, you began your nonprofit work. Um, so there is I, I, the, the, the subject broadly Can is, I just say, yeah. Jack is fantastic. And I'm glad I'm not okay. running against him. Yeah. Not yet, anyway. Well. Um, uh, well he committed very uh, forthrightly to saying there needs to be this specific uh, uh, commitment to a budget line for arts education, music classes, art classes, dance, theater, the rest of it in schools. Do you agree with that? Oh, I do. I think it's a very important part of the future economy of New York City. Uh, obviously, we have uh, uh, tourism is one of the uh, uh, growing businesses uh, for our future. Uh, and the arts and, and uh, uh, the culture uh, of New York City is important for people all over the world to come here. I myself am an artist. Uh, there were uh, two stories in the New York Times uh, last week. Uh, one about my house and buying it from John Casamitidis on East 84th Street in 1989. And in the picture, the, the thing that I love the most about it, in the picture of me in the office in my house is a work of art that I painted on the wall. You can only see three-fourths of it. Um, and then later on in the week in the home section, they had a story about how my wife and I bought Raphael Gustavino's house in Bayshore, Long Island, that was on the seven uh, 
uh, to save list, uh, landmarks to save. Um, and Gustavino is a, a, a well-known uh, uh, architect and, and tile, a structural tile. Uh, uh, and he built this house for himself and, and his family in Bayshore. And it was empty for five years and was going to be destroyed. And it's the, it is magnificent. Um, and we saved it. Um, so I have an interest in, in arts and historical preservation, uh, both by being a painter myself right. and also by recognizing Gustavino's great house. Um, well, congratulations on owning Thank fantastic you. real estate in Long Island and the Upper East Side. <laughs> but um, uh, read the article. I will. The, under under the, the Bloomberg administration, um, among other things, in terms of education, is this, is this great growth in charter schools. Yes. Uh, doubled in the last four years, probably doubled in the four years before that. It's now 5% of uh, New York City children going to 160-odd charter schools. Should that, is that a worthwhile experiment? Is, and and it, at this point, it's sort of beyond an experiment. Should, it, should that doubling... Continue? I was going to say it, it definitely is beyond a, a experiment, and I think that we ought to learn. I, after all, the charter schools are New York City public schools, and I think that we ought to learn the valuable lessons uh, uh, for all of our schools that we're learning uh, in the charter schools and in the advanced New York City public schools. It's not like we don't have uh, creativity going on in our school system in other places other than, than charters. Uh, I think that, the, and you didn't ask this, but I'm going to say it, I think that the next mayor has a great opportunity uh, to be able to uh, burst this bubble of animosity between the teachers' union and the mayor. I think, I liken it to 12 years ago when Michael Bloomberg was elected mayor. There was great racial tension in our city. Any of us that lived here then know that, and because the previous mayor uh, wouldn't meet with people of color. Uh, so you can understand how they felt excluded. And as soon as Mayor Bloomberg was elected, he did meet with people of color and he had an inclusive administration. And that just almost overnight took the pressure of racism out of our city. And I believe that we can do that with the relationship between the mayor and the teachers union. Well, actually there is, there is a pressure right now of racism in the city, it's well. There is now. The schools. I was I was using oh, okay. that as an example of that time. I mean, we're all smart enough to understand what I was saying, right? Mm -hmm. That I was talking about 12 Not years ago. Not stopping I understand. Okay. Right. But, so, it, but no. I I mean, you know, we have to be careful in these campaigns because they will take things out of context, and then somebody will say tomorrow, "Oh, McDonald said there wasn't any racial tension in New York," but you know, I'm the only man or the only person, rather, that talks about the mass incarceration of African-American men in America and how that's devastated African-American families and how our shelter system and the Doe Fund's shelters are filling up with young men, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, who aren't educated, who can't work, and who have criminal records. And if you want to burst that bubble of racism that we feel today, let's get jobs and educate the young men of color in our city. And we won't have to worry about the police tactics. There won't be any, because we will be safe. That is the last frontier of public safety, is getting jobs for these young men who have no hope. It is. Thank you. It is um, schools with w worse uh, graduation rates, worse outcomes, as it happens, perhaps no coincidence, that have are most deprived of, of money for arts education in school. Um, and I want to thank my collaborator on this next question, who is a student from Queens, just graduated from LaGuardia High School, headed to NYU. Thank you, Candace Lee Camacho, who may be in the audience still if she's put up this long with what we're doing. In any event, beyond, beyond the general funding issues, uh, which I w would love you to talk about, of, of $300 a kid per year for arts education in New York City, how do you address the, even the growing inequality between what kids 
in, in, in schools and neighborhoods where their parents can't afford to buy them instruments and can't afford to buy them the art supplies that the city of New York is no longer paying for. Well, how, do you, I mean, how do you address that? I mean, there's, there's the commitment to, that you're getting from everybody to spend more money, a, a point and a half on, you know, and I think that that's reasonable. But I believe that the unsustainable portion of our city budget is the health insurance that uh, city employees don't pay for any of it. So I'm proposing that they pay 20% which, well, nobody, you know, in the private sector, we all pay for a portion of our health insurance. The federal government pays for it. The state government pays for it. And you know what? Michigan paid for it, too, Detroit. And now look at the shape that Detroit is in. 70, every New York City employee has a salary, and then 70% of that salary is fringe. Now, that's unsustainable. We can't do that any longer. But if we get... Uh, every, we're all in this together, then we'll have money to be able to do this. And that's the problem. It is unsustainable, ladies and gentlemen, our city budget, the way that it's going. And the, the, the uncontrollable cost for the city are the pension plans, because that's the state legislature. And you know what they do. The state legislature is like a slow motion crime wave. So you can imagine what these pension plans are all fill, full up. You know, the last three years that somebody works, the overtime, uh, and all of that wonderful stuff. There's, there's not much that the mayor can do about that. But there is something that, that we can do about the health insurance. And we can reform the health insurance and make it better for the city employees at the same time while they recognize that we're all in this together. You mentioned that uh, the arts are really important to the city's economy, tourism, jobs, etc. Well, how would you pay to support those institutions? Well, but you're not going to I mean, take that out of the, uh, the health fund? Uh, the city well, sure. I mean, up. I heard an idea. How that, much money can you that, get that out of the startups? Uh, uh, well, you can get a billion six, actually. You can get a lot of money. I mean, so, uh, but I heard before uh, uh, talking about startups and those kinds of things. I started a not for profit myself. I went to Grand Central Terminal after a woman died of starvation in the richest country and in, in the richest city in the center of it. And, you know, I said to the people laying there, if you, you want to work, you know, I'll provide an opportunity and we'll put together an organization. And that's all I had, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't have a penny. I didn't have a penny. I lived in a six by nine SRO room two blocks away from where I live now on East 81st Street. And I went to Grand Central Terminal for 700 nights in a row feeding people. And I, be, I, knew, they lis I listened to what they said. I didn't know why people were homeless when I went there, but I listened. I heard what they said. They appreciated the sandwich, but they wanted a room and a job to pay for it. A room and a job to pay for it. I became convinced that they wanted to work and I put together a program for them to work, and now we do $50 million a year. We've done $750 million in revenue since we started. We clean 150 miles of New York City streets and sidewalks every day, and we provide an opportunity for people to climb that economic ladder, at upward mobility, all folks who didn't have a chance before who have prison records and who are African American, so they're born behind the eight ball in this country. Well, nicely said. Well, it's not nice to say. It isn't, but we have to start saying it. Because if we want a safe city, if we want a productive city, if we want a city where we recognize, look, you go to Central Park on a Sunday afternoon and there's people from all over the world, 220, 230 different countries, all getting along. We can have that if we just take this final piece and we educate and we provide economic opportunity for these folks. They deserve it, and it's time that we as a city recognize it. And in terms of educating them, is it your view, as it has been so many of the candidates this evening, that we uh, are focused and have been focused too strictly and narrowly on the results of standardized tests? Oh, I think that teachers ought to be involved in developing the curriculum. I think that we ought to have a, somebody with educational experience as the, the head of the Department of Education. So I, I would move to the Common Core and, and not, to, uh, not focus on the test so much. I, first of all, I don't think that there are people, that some children, really don't test well. 
I mean, my grandson. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I have four children and three grandchildren. My four children, two of them went to New York City Public Schools and, and my two grandsons go to New York City Public Schools. So I have some experience with it. Uh, but I'm sure he appreciates you not embarrassing by saying exactly by how saying badly he Tommy does on tests. Didn't do well. um, Just one more thing. Um, uh, the current mayor believes that uh, this, the government should give less money, philanthropists should give more money. We're seeing uh, uh, a museums say that there's been a permanent decline in public support for higher education, the difficulty of uh, donors, uh, of obtaining donors for governing boards, and a shift in philanthropic focus that's affected them all across the country. Well, if, uh, if we're going to rely on philanthropists, and philanthropists are not going to give money to the arts, uh, they're giving less and less to the symphony orchestras and the museums, <coughs> excuse me, giving more to other kinds of causes if they're giving money at all. So where does money come from? Well, I think that, that you know, we should take it the six to one matching funds that somebody who's a, a tweeting things that a few years ago wouldn't be allowed in a museum. Um, that's Wiener is getting matching funds. So he's getting your money to do his uh, rehabilitation or whatever you want to call this that, that he's doing. <laughs> no, seriously, he's getting Who's matching Wiener? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Only wish. Then maybe we could talk about the issues. Well, uh, but I would be in favor of some kind of a matching fund program that uh, the, the city uh, and private dollars. I don't know exactly what, but I think that to encourage philanthropy, uh, matching grants have always been a, you know, a part of it. We raise a third of our budget from private sources, a third from the city, and a third through earned generated revenue work that we do. So we're familiar with needing different funding streams. Uh, and, and I think that it would behoove the city uh, to get involved with, with some kind of a cultural uh, matching or you know, multiplier of uh, private money to encourage all of these wealthy people who live here, right? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you. So, so let me do this, please. I know that there are probably three Republicans here. Okay, and September 10th. Are you is, willing to admit it? Sub, September yes. 10th is the Republican primary. I need 17,000 votes. Okay, 17,000 votes. So if you have a friend that's a Republican, <laughs> you know, if you know if if you know anybody, because I'm conservative with your money and liberal with your rights. So thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And next we have Green Party candidate Anthony Gronowitz. So I thought I'd provide you with a piece of campaign literature. My photograph on the front is when I applied for Kathy Black's job, I got all dressed up. I figured if she can run the school system, I can run the Hearst Corporation. Uh -huh. We got some good publicity, us, the Greens did. So I take it you're in favor of people with uh, credentialed educational backgrounds running the Department of Education? Yes, I, I think that would be, that's wise. That's why the public school situation is as bad as it's become. People who are just interested in making money running the city rather than building a sense of community, restoring the arts. After all, you can't have civilization without having the arts. And that means participation by all the people in the city. And, it, and, and one, yes. Go ahead. No, no, no I please. just wondered if, I don't if want to interrupt you. I want to do a how, monologue like so uh, many of the candidates have. We, we can argue about the good things or the bad things that the, 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 this president administration has done in terms of the schools, but when you look at the metrics on how the arts have been funded and supported uh, in the public schools the last six, seven years, it's, it's downward and in some cases sort of shockingly downward. Is it simply, as other candidates have said, a matter of, of mayoral priorities and saying, by God, no, I really care about the arts? How, how, how do we get that 
funding and that commitment back up. You're the Green Party candidate. Is it a matter of just turning off the lights and saving all the money from the electric bill? No, it's, it's utilizing the sun and not these uh, artificial lights, opening up atriums. No, solar roofs, solar panels, of course. Uh, but in terms of the arts education, um, you have to restore what was in the public schools. I uh, went to PS6 many years ago. Actually, I carried the desks from the old PS6 on 85th and Madison to the new one on 82nd and Madison. And that was in the fifth grade. And we put on a play. Three of us went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art before it was overrun by tourists when the dollar was strong in the 1950s. And we wrote a play and put it on. It was fabulous. I still have the script. Custer's Last Stand. I played Custer. Uh, so I mean, schools like PS6, with these highly engaged, more affluent than average parents, they don't have to worry so much. Uh, it, is, it is obviously schools in, in, in districts and areas with lesser uh, means where, where these cutbacks mean there is simply no music, no painting in many, many schools. Well, it's heartbreaking. I worked for, the, for a year for the American History Social Project, which is part of City University. I've been involved in education for 45 years. And I was sent out to Wingate High School, and I went to a wonderful art class, and the students were busy making paintings, um, doing graphics. And I said to the teacher, how do you get them to do all of this? She said, I go out and buy the supplies. It, this is disgusting. It is disgraceful. And it's getting worse. OK, this was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I witnessed this at Wingate High School in Brooklyn, which reminded me of Rikers Island, because I taught at Rikers Island in the late 70s. And it was run like Rikers Island, with, with weapons checks and guards all over the place, uh, like a prison. The school to prison pipeline that Michelle Alexander talks about. Now, I should say, it's serendipitous, but the front page of the New York Times features a story about the mayor of Richmond, California, Gail McLaughlin, who has resorted to eminent domain and seized houses for people whose buildings, homes are underwater in the name of the public good. It just so happens she's a Green. She's a member of the Green Party. You can look this up, look at today's times. Now, do we have to wait till New York City is in this condition? Well, in terms of class polarization, it is. The Fiscal Policy Institute noted that the inequalities in this city are greater than they've been since the 19th century. We talked about the 18th century. I thought it introduced the 19th century here. Uh, certainly, we've gone back to the 19th century in terms of class inequality. Um, whatever happened, let us say, to projects like West Beth, 1970, the old AT&T building down in the West Village. My parents were asked if they'd like to, you know, their income was low. My father was a writer and a poet. Would they like to come in? It was very, relatively reasonable. Why isn't the mayor doing this? Of course I would devote 1% to uh, the arts education. You know, and, and I don't like what the mayor did, for instance, to indigenous artistic communities like Rebel Diaz. Back on February, tw February 28th of this year, their complex in the South Bronx was raided by the mayor's police who violently destroyed everything. This group did murals, painting, music, they're hip hop. And hip hop is indigenous music to the South Bronx and the Bronx is the poorest urban county in the nation. These people need support, we need support. The artists need support, the people need support. Wall Street is at a record, homelessness is at a record. There is obviously a correspondence. Must we go back to Plato? This is all cities are cities of rich and poor. I've done enough monologue. You get the drift. <laughs> eminent domain. Eminent domain. Go after these people. They're not going to leave. The rich are not going to leave. They've been here forever in this city. 
It's, it's great to be able to talk in an idealistic way, but would you be willing to produce and fund a comprehensive cultural plan for New York City? Of course. Which engages all branches of government and calls for interagency participation. Well, it's not just a matter of bureaucracy and interagency participation. It's a matter of involving the communities, involving the people, going out and seeing where the action is. My, my platform embraces the insurgencies of the city, like rebel Diaz. We, we give them support. I'm a faculty advisor to the Borough of Manhattan Community College student government. We invite them to use the theater to perform. Yes, there has to be a partnership with already existing educational institutions and the community and the indigenous artists. The agency, a lot of this money is ill spent. Yes, we have to have cooperation between the agencies, but we also have to have community involvement. And when, as under the Bloomberg administration, certainly these partnerships with all kinds of nonprofit cultural organizations, large and small, has increased, um, which some have, certainly some in the, in the, in the world of, of teachers and, and the public school establishment, are, are wary of as somehow outsourcing education. How do, you, how do you feel about that, that kind of partnership with, with, outs, with our bringing artists in, bringing outside organizations in to, to backfill the teaching that isn't being done by full-time teachers? Well, that's because Bloomberg did more to destroy the public education system. He removed music and art and phys ed, which is an absolute international disgrace, okay? He famously said December 1st, 2011 at MIT, you can look this all up, I would be satisfied with a classroom of 70 in a public education when he sends his two kids to Dalton School where the class size is 20. Why not use the private schools like Dalton and Trinity where I went to as the standard for the public schools and tax the rich and go after the buildings and the empty spaces and utilize them as Westbeth was, as Gail McLaughlin is doing in Richmond. Do we have to reach that nadir before we do something? It's, it's, it's a desperate situation. And stop and frisk, it's not only criminal, it is also pedagogically unsound. My students come shattered to school. How can they paint? How can they write? How can they do anything when the mayor, in his words, my private army, the New York City Police Department, uh, has done its whatever on any of the students coming in? This is a, this is a fact, a reality that I have to live with when I teach at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, which represents 130 different nations. Yes, there should be this partnership, but there has to be more. There has to be community involvement, and there's plenty of indigenous culture going on. All the mayor was interested in is dead art and his favorite artists. That's you, men all. you mentioned hip hop as an example of indigenous art. Certainly, that's a fair description. What else do you mean when you talk about indig indigenous art? Well, you have to provide spaces for the artists to do their work. Soho before it became Soho in fashion boutique. There were a lot of artists there in 1968 and 69. It was trucks by day, moonlight at night. But there were a lot of artists doing wonderful work down there because the rents were low. There has to be rent control. We have to have that. As Koch said in 1980, the standard was one month's rent, one week's work. It's ridiculous. We have to curb the real estate and banking interests. We're gonna to have to get to the situation as you see, we can read in today's Times, the front page, look her up. She's a member of the Green Party. This is a national party. We're dead serious. We don't want New York to head to Detroit. I mean, Bloomberg is leaving for London. Obviously, it is our gain and London's loss. Anthony Granowitz. <laughs> Anthony Granowitz, thank you very much. Vogue And our next candidate, a Democrat, the Honorable Sal Albanese. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice. How are you? Good to see you. So I'm going to get back to, uh, I don't know how much you've heard of the, uh, the previous speakers. I've heard a lot. Well, <laughs> we started off with Rick Beneke pointing out that New York is home to over 1,300 nonprofit cultural uh, institutions, thousands of artists. 
Uh, New York City nonprofit culture attracts 98 million visitors to over 100,000 events like exhibitions and performances. It attracts 23.8 million tourists to New York, generates an estimated $8.1 billion a year, which is a major contribution to the city's economy, generates over 120,000 jobs, which stimulates the economy, and yet it receives less than one quarter of 1% of the overall city expense budget. Well, I, uh, I think it's outrageous that uh, uh, we are the arts and culture capital of the world and uh, we're not funding uh, that area adequately. I mean, I, I, I just think it's misplaced priorities. Um, I, uh, I was a school teacher for 11 years, so I, I was actually in the classroom of the New York City Public Schools, and um, I've watched the erosion uh, of uh, spending on arts and music and, and uh, physical education, things that are not frills. I, I, I consider art education not a frill. It's, it's definitely connected to educating the whole child. Um, it, it's, it's not something that should be treated as a, uh, as a lark. And um, uh, for example, uh, principals right now are able to, uh, to use money that's allocated for the arts. Even though it's inadequate, they're able to divert it to other areas, which I think is wrong. And we shouldn't, I mean, I believe principals should have flexibility in terms of running their schools, but I don't think they should be able to divert the entire um, budget to, to uh, other areas. And, um, so and that's you, would, you would make the supplementary arts funding actually be supplementary arts directed funding? Directed to arts, not giving principals the flexibility. And, and, and I don't want to blame simply the principals. I think that we got, we've gotten to a stage in our education system where we're teaching to the test. A lot of pressures on principals, uh, teachers, and students with this high-risk testing process that we're involved in. That, and so principals throw everything at, at teaching to the test, and you divert the areas that we, the kids need, like art, music, physical education. So I would, I would certainly fund it uh, from the expense budget at a 1% rate. I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think in the long run, it, it, it's going to produce a more holistic child. Well, this is a two-pronged discussion. We're talking about uh, funding for the schools, which has been in serious decline, and funding for nonprofit arts institutions. There is a, a certain amount of synergy there because um, the, uh, the 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 uh, these uh, not these arts organizations serve as crucial tools for learning, both within and beyond the schools. You can only imagine how much more could be done if the city supported the theater companies, the dance companies, the smaller arts institutions. And we are giving, we are actually spending one quarter of 1% of the city budget on nonprofit cultural organizations, despite the fact that New York is the art center of the world. All right, and once again, it's misplaced priority. And, and you're right, there's a synergy between the community-based organizations and the schools. I mean, uh, our young people go into the museums, art studios, and you can work together. Uh, and I would direct my chancellor to make this a priority to, to create that synergy with the Department of Cultural Affairs. So uh, our, our, we, we've got so many assets here in the city and, and cultural the cultural area and the arts area that our kids should be able to access that and and con continue to continue to th keep our cultural institutions thriving because we're producing uh, more more literate young people and more holistic young people who would, who would also become citizens who would who would value the arts and, and it just would would uh, generate itself o over time. Well, so po polls indicate that the public would uh, want to see more support for the arts. Can we uh, have some kind of a, an arts tax that uh, might be added on to uh, well, actually support the arts institutions? I, I wouldn't go as far as an arts tax, but I can tell you under an Albany's administration, we would provide adequate funding. The 1% number makes a lot of sense from the expense budget, which would take care of uh, a lot of the needs that we have and would support the arts. And also my, my plan to make sure that the principals direct the money uh, towards arts education would be uh, would also be in place, and I've got a way, I've got a vehicle for paying for it as well. Um, uh, I, I Which think, is well, I I, uh, I spent the last the last 15 years in finance, uh, and uh, as uh, I, I I know a lot about pension plans, and the New York City pension plan is a clunker. It's really uh, uh, and it has to be modernized. Uh, for example, the Toronto system performs three percent better 
consistently in the New York City system because they, they, they've modernized their plan. If the New York City uh, pension system uh, functioned as well or performed as well as the, the Toronto system, the city would save about $2.5 billion a year. Uh, because the city contributed $8 billion last year to the pension plan. If it performed 3% better, it would be about two, two $2.5 billion, which we could use to balance the budget and provide services like arts education. I, what I will do is work with the labor unions because I need their permission uh, to, to reform and modernize the plan. Uh, and and uh, in exchange for uh, a pay raise, I would want them to come forward and to give me the flexibility to do that. And also, I think George McDonald hit on something as well. I don't I, I think uh, our health care um, bill for the city is astronomical. I don't support what George is saying, but I do support streamlining it. For example, there are 84, 84 different supplementary health care plans that the unions have. I would ask the unions to merge them into one, and then we could leverage that by dealing with, pharma, with the pharmaceutical industry and with other health care providers to bring down the cost and uh, uh, also save the city money so we can provide services. And the other, the other issue, of course, is we, we give away a lot of money uh, in terms of tax breaks to developers sometimes that don't need them. I'm not against tax breaks, oh, but if they create jobs and they create development where we need those developments, uh, we, have, uh, we have a history of giving away largesse to campaign contributors. I, I've drawn a very bright line in my campaign. I'm not accepting money from people who do business with the city. I'm not accepting money from developers or lobbyists because, because if you get there, if you get there, all we favors all over town, all the rhetoric that we mount in these campaigns will, will not come to fruition. So I want to make decisions on the merits. And there's, we, we have a $70 billion budget. I think it's tragic that we don't, we don't spend. Our priorities are not directed towards uh, uh, services that the city really needs. And, and uh, we can balance the budget and provide valuable services. The city has given NBC two tax breaks and incentives uh, over the last 15 years. Um, maybe it's because NBC is doing so poorly in the ratings that they need the help. But um, I mean, NBC. I th you know, I is mean, it those, because those, we're afraid they're going to move to New Jersey? Those are all things we have to look at. I, I, I you know, I they, look. New York City is the greatest city in the world, and part of the reason is because the education, arts, and culture are capital of the world, and people want to do business here. They want to come to New York City. We don't have to give away the store, uh, but once again, if you look at the, if you look at the campaign filings of, of the candidates, you'll see why. Uh, the, the store is given away because these contributions, some of the candidates have over a million dollars from the real estate industry. They're not going to be able to make decisions on the merits and development. So you've got, you've got to look at that when you're evaluating the candidates. Uh, and we've talked a lot about, a lot about education and, and it's, it's my top priority. It's my passion. I did it for 11 years. Uh, I came here as an immigrant uh, at the age of eight, and uh, it was the public schools, the libraries, the sports programs that elevated my family from the working class to the middle class. My mother was a garment worker, so I believe in the, the city elevates people, and, and we have to provide the services to do that. But we're missing the boat when it comes to education. I, it's clear now, uh, neurologists and psychologists have, have, have proven beyond a reasonable doubt that, that many of our young people come into our schools at four or five years old, way behind. And the reason, and many of them never catch up. I mean, the average middle class kid comes into a school building at four years old knowing 1,400 words. Your average poor, from a poor community knows about 300 words. The reason is, it's not an IQ issue, it's poverty. Poverty causes stress, stress causes developmental issues. So I want to set up uh, pediatric wellness centers in low income communities around the city where we start working with parents, uh, with parents, doctors, and teachers working together in a multidisciplinary approach. So, uh, so our kids come into our school building on an even, even kill. I want to merge all of our early childhood programs into a department of, of early education so that we really focus on that zero to three age. I think it's political malpractice not to address this because now we know that this is a major cause of a lot of issues. Kids get, get, get referred to special education. They wind up in our criminal justice system simply because of these issues and uh, we, we've got to address it. So I've got a plan, my education plan is clear. It's, it's the cornerstone of my, my, uh, uh, my policy to set up five pediatric wellness centers and eat one in each borough track those kids, and, I, and I'd like to do it with some private funding to begin with, and then we'll, we can show that it's successful.
successful and begin to really address that because the, the elephant in the room when it comes to our failing schools is poverty. And, 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 and if you don't address that, if you don't, you don't address those, those factors that drive these kids in, into uh, unfortunate, uh, um, unfortunate circumstances early on, it, I think it's malpractice. So I, I want to address it um, and I'm going to do it as mayor. As, as a cultural consumer, as a cultural consumer, si uh, resident, citizen in the city of New York, what, what, what do you love? What, what are you most passionate about seeing, doing, experiencing culturally? Well, I love, I love going, going to the theater. Um, I, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's just, uh, it's great. We, we live in the, uh, you know, in, in the theater center of the world. Uh, so that's something that I really love. I mean, I, I, um, I, one of the things that I, that I noticed when I first came to the United States was I came on a, a the Christopher Columbus. It was a, you know, I was eight years old. It was a, a, I was, we, we came into the harbor and I was, look, I was on the deck and I saw the Statue of Liberty and it was just, uh, I, I didn't know what it meant, what it signified at that, but it was such an awesome experience and it's all due to architecture and, and, and that had a real impact on me. So it, uh, without art, and without culture, we're really not a great civilization. So we have to foster it, and it's not even that expensive to do it. And you actually came on a boat. Yeah, yeah, it's wow. amazing. You know, sometimes people make fun of, you know, you came here on a boat. I really came here on a boat. Yeah. Uh, you, were, you were off the boat. Yes, I was off the boat. Um, Christopher, in those days, I came uh, in 19, we, we came here in 1958, and it was the Italian line, Christopher yeah. Columbus, that took us across the water in seven days. And I got seasick, by the way, okay. as well. Sal Albanese, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Nice talking to you. Thanks. I can't remember which one the bus was. Because he just. It doesn't matter anymore. And another Democratic candidate. Independent candidate, if you don't mind. Oh, really? Yeah, An independent right. candidate? Yes. Abby Laurel Smith. Hello. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Now, you are, you have been a working artist. You have yes. poet and a painter. All my life since the age of two. That's all I've ever done. But you've also described yourself as a nihilist. I'm not sure that that is the best word <laughs> to, for someone who is running for mayor I think to describe I, himself as. I think I have moved away from that period. Oh. So I am different now. I'm very relieved. Yes. Uh, <laughs> do you have? I'm more of a realist now, and I think let's get the city back to business. That's what I would say. So do have, do you have a plan for supporting the arts in New York? Do you see that? Uh, I guess you have a bias because you've been a working artist. Uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I think first of all we have to look at the education system and also we have to educate the people that are grown up in business, the people that we come across every day. A lot of people don't know anything about art, they don't know anything about culture, they don't know anything about dance. And they look at it from the business model. It doesn't work like that. It is different. Art is a creative endeavor. It is what makes us what we are today. It tells us where we were before and where we're going. And um, there's a lot to it. What's um, the best thing a city of New York and a mayor running a city of New York can do to, to, to encourage and nurture that spirit of art? As a mayor, you have the power to do a lot. Like I said, from school, the way people are taught about art. Also, you also have to let people know that there's a difference, a huge gap between artist and artist. One without an E, the other one with an E. The best way to go about that is to let people realize that what we're being given or handed what we see every day from Hollywood is not actually what you could call or equate to art or culture. So if you want to fund art, you have to go to the basics. Fund the real art, the artists, the organizations that support them. Make it easy for them to live in the city and to practice their job. I mean, 
what they love to do. Uh, there's also what we call appreciation. That is something that is not in the curriculum, which means if you cannot draw or paint or play music or appreciate um, or write, you should at least learn certain keywords to be able to understand what art is all about. You need to know, um, learn the language. And that, that way it becomes easier for you to relate to right. art. It no. becomes easier for you to relate to the people who practice these things. It becomes easier for you to see where they're coming mm -hmm. from. No, and I'm, that I'm, way it will be easier for anyone who's a mayor to say, yes, I want to support the art. I want to increase funding for the arts. I was curious about your saying that we're not Hollywood. Actually, we are becoming Hollywood to some degree. We have four major film studios in Brooklyn and Long Island City. Okay. And more and more filming is being done here, adding a lot to the, uh, the, the city's income. Um, yes. But you think that that's less important than the other? I would say it's less important, but the question is how many artists do they have on the film set when they were making the films? Well, they were hiring a lot of people to They hire a lot of people, but they don't hire artists. Artists could look at a film script and draw up different kind of things and even give you options and say you can film this this way, you can film this that way, or you can go this way, or you can create your stage in this way, on this manner, approach your film in this way. I've never seen any artist on the film set. Artists have been a way screened out. One could argue that, that motion filmmakers and actors are artists, but that's maybe a semantic uh, well, question. We belong to the union. Fine you know artists that. have an edge. Have I'm an edge? A, yes, they have an edge when it comes to creating things like that or setting up stages. I do it. I've done it for Kenneth Branagh. But, but for a fine artist like yourself, yes. should the city of New York be handing out money to you? Or how, how should that work? The city of New York, I won't say the city should hand out money to me. But if the city is going to give me something as an artist, or if the city is going to give artists something, they should say, OK, we have this program. You'll be in this building for maybe a year or two. Whilst you're working and practicing or painting, you could as well teach these kids, or you could be involved in this project. If, there, if you set up something like that, you will bring a lot of artists into the city. Uh -huh. You will make practicing in the city easier because a lot of artists can't afford the rent. And, and again, speaking as yes. the first practicing present artist on our stage tonight, what keeps you here? I want to change things. I want to change this for the way they are now, because it shouldn't be this way. We are heading towards a crash, a huge crash. We need to see it for what it is, and we need to approach it for what it is. We cannot solve it by going with the business approach, which means take this out, take that out, ship this off, and do it this way. It won't work. For example, look at what is happening in um, Staten Island, the people who got affected by a hurricane. A lot of them are firefighters. A lot of them are veterans. A lot of them work in the police department. They don't have houses to go to anymore. It is affecting their job performances. Not just that, their kids are failing. Look at some of them have third graders. They have to do exams. They have to perform. They don't have ways and means to study at home. That is affecting their performances. It shouldn't be so. That is why I got into this race. Which means I have removed myself from being an artist. I'm coming into this because I think I could do this this way, I could do this that way. But I, in the process of getting into this race, yes, I had about 1% funding asking for more. It could be from the source, it could be from tax, it could be from private businesses, it could be from all kinds of things. But we need to look into that. And do you think you, as an artist, uh, being mayor of New York City would m be able to, to accomplish all the administrative managerial decisions that, that uh, are required of a mayor, making those tough fiscal choices and so on? Yes and no, because if I say yes, I can do it, then I'll be seen as a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, you need to drive the engine. You need to set up something and set up a goal 
But you also have to remember that the city runs with different set of people. You have those that are elected, you have those that are professionals who are not elected. You have to put the professionals in their place and let them do their job. You cannot bring people from outside who did not have any experience about what works in that area to tell them this is how I want. Where did you go to school? I studied in Oxford. Uh -huh. I used to be a professional student. I studied history of art and heritage management. Mm -hmm. And but before then I studied fine art and before then I studied music history. But you have had no experience of New York City schools, so uh, much of the discussion tonight has been about how great, I don't know how great they really were, because uh, I have some sad memories, but how great <laughs> they used to be yes. and how terrible they are today. Um, yes. you, you, you would be expected to improve things without really knowing what's gone wrong. Um, we've, uh, Kurt has been talking about just um, how many schools are working right now without art teachers, full-time art teachers, without full-time music teachers. They often rely on outside groups to come in and pick up the slack, which is not the worst thing in the world. But it is the worst. To well, it's that been, been for long, it, it also it also is a way that artists make money, and it's a way that the kids come in contact with real artists, which I think is quite good. But it does not really take the place of having a full-time teacher in a, a school uh, that, the, that uh, can teach regular classes. Because the commitment is not there. You put the teacher in a situation where he or she has got to think about, if I'm doing this part-time, then I've got to go somewhere else as a well time to do something else. It shouldn't be. We need people that will be there day and night, professional teachers. So if you have people who have gone to art school, the real art school who studied fine art, then it is better for them to have like a teaching certificate afterwards. If they have that, it will be easier for them to teach and practice at the same time. We need people like that in the city. And the best way to do that is to, like I said, housing is important for artists. If, um, I mean, I'd love to build, I love building houses. I love building properties. I mean, it's one of the things that I study, and which is one of the reasons that I'm in this race. I'd love to build a lot of affordable houses in the city. Now, finding the land to build or finding properties to build is another thing because there are certain things you have to look at. I was just um, in contact with a community board night, some which is around this area, because I go around and I read all the buildings around the world, uh, everywhere. But my point is um, we need professional teachers, not part-time teachers. They should be musicians who have worked in the field, who have practiced in the field, who knows how to relate to kids. Also, they need to have a teaching certificate. That is very important. But we need to have a system in place that will bring them into the city, make them comfortable to sit in the city, and make them comfortable to teach. When you have, were working as a painter, yes. did you feel that the city was supportive of you as an artist who um, wanted to show, who... Uh, no, not at all. But if I should want to survive think of, in the city? If I should think of myself about as a painter, I think I have been extremely lucky. Because I used to copy at the Metropolitan Museum. I've had exhibitions in a lot of places. And I've done a lot of things that most people, most artists cannot do. They used to call me Michelangelo in Venice. I didn't realize that until I got to New York. I didn't realize how good I was until I was here. So the city has not been supportive, but certain people in the city have been very supportive. Out of, say, 100% of people that I've met, I would say like less than 1% have been. Which is why I said people need to know more about art, they need to know more about culture, they need to know more about where art is coming from, how important it is for us. I'd love to go all over the city and see performances, music, classical music, I can't say that. I'd love to see people perform Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the simplest thing you could perform with like maybe one bench, two bench, you have. I haven't seen that around. It's not just a performance, you learn the language, you learn a lot of things from all of this. That is based in New York. Mr. Laurel Smith, it has yeah. been a pleasure meeting you, talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thanks a lot. Was it two more? Our next guest is Democratic candidate Cecilia Berkowitz. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you as well. Yes. Nice to meet you. Excuse Oops. me, I'm so Oops. sorry. It's okay, you didn't knock it over. I have a ankle, so it's hard to uh, coordinate everything. Excuse me. Nice to be here and meet you all and speak about the arts. Well, your background uh, was in uh, finance, wasn't it? Uh, correct, I've studied management and finance at the Wharton School. I worked many different places at Tiffany and Company, where they taught me a lot about their type of arts. You know, Tiffany designs through jewelry, they have a foundation, they support the arts. Um, there's a lot of artistic people involved in their company, the jewelry designers and others. And we learned a lot about the history of New York City as well. So I worked at Tiffany for over three years, thought about staying there forever. But I decided to uh, go back to school soon after, studied accounting in an MBA program at Rutgers, more aligned with my undergrad interests and other work and internships at Prudential and other places. Um, after, after I finished graduate school, I worked, uh, started working downtown for a CPA firm um, on the Lower East Side and, and on Wall Street at the time. It's now just in, downtown by where his family is and by the mayor's former press secretary, Stu Glozer. They're good friends. I also worked a bit at a French accounting firm. I studied French as a major undergrad as well and know a bit about French culture, uh, Florence, uh, Italy. So my boyfriend's from Algeria with relatives in France. So I do a lot with uh, you know international aspect of business as well. Well, we are been talking a lot about uh, ways of financing the arts. So I guess an accountant would be somebody who might actually find ways to do that. Uh, we give tax breaks to major corporations to keep them in New York. Do you think it makes economic sense to support our cultural institutions yes. in the same way? I do. I think that one of the most valuable aspects to a large city like Paris, like New York, like some of the other major cities is the, is the arts. And I, I spend a lot of time in Philadelphia as well with the government there, where they have museums, arts, culture, and I think it's extremely important to keep it in New York City where it's even better. So yes, I think it's important to help, help fund the arts. And I uh, wrote a previous speech in which I criticized both the Democrats and Republicans, uh, the typical Democrats and Republicans, for their, um, their way that they fund programs. The Republicans sometimes are only worried about their own household and don't reach out to support other, other people like artists, which is very important. And that's why Mayor Bloomberg called himself going Democrat when he said he wanted to help out uh, different organizations. And I know he gives a lot of funding to the arts. Now, wait, 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 he gives a lot of personal funding to the arts. Funding. He has uh, cut back on city funding to the arts. Uh, yeah, we'll his people usually tell him what to do. One of the topics here is whether the city should give 1% of well, I, I, to yeah, the arts. Well, yeah, I know there's a lot of budget problems right now. And while well, I, I know that the, I read that part, yeah, he gave a lot of personal funding to the arts and to African Americans and a lot of people. So he calls that going Democrat. Well, his people advise him on the city. I guess that's his independent aspect. I think that uh, a lot of the Democrats in government also uh, do something like a, a not very, uh, um, a hardworking, uh, responsible way of allocating money and that they tax, tax people, even an artist who maybe makes a few hundred thousand dollars a year, they might need that money. Maybe they have uh, unpaid uh, bills, uh, debt, loans, uh, educational You know artists make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you I, must I don't be know. hanging out with Jeff Koons otherwise. Sometimes the household. <laughs> well, I don't know how much they make. Uh, my mom has a friend who's an artist in Hoboken. Her husband was a professor, a math professor. So sometimes if it's a wife with a husband, in my town where I grew up, the librarian in elementary school, her husband was some sort of artist. They normally live in one or seven, several million dollar houses. So the, the artists we have in the suburbs, like Westchester, they sometimes have enough money, but then again, they have children's educations and uh, retirement accounts they might not be able to afford if they got a medical expense. There's different kinds of artists. Of course, there's the poor, starving artists. And there's also uh, the wealthier artists. So I don't really know what was, it's very funny because uh, those are artists. But uh, yeah, I mean, we know different kinds of artists. The point is, if you have like a gallery, let's say you open a gallery or some sort of business. And um, yeah, if you open, say, a gallery in Chelsea and you make a few hundred thousand dollars or something in one year um, that you are able to keep as income, you kind of need that money. So to have that, the point is they're, they're usually not very wealthy, even if they make that in one year. In different ways, maybe they take a side job, maybe they're an art professor, maybe they got some sort of uh, job. So uh, 
Because of this, they need their money when they make a few hundred thousand dollars. So is that is that the best thing that the city can do, do you think, to support people working in culture, like who own galleries or artists, is just keeping their taxes low so that they can afford uh, to do their art? Um, yes, well, I think it's important to not overtax people when they start to make a living when they still don't have enough money. And that's what my accounting professors at Rutgers uh, in the department, when I was, uh, went back as a student a few years ago, more than a few years ago, taxing people who barely have enough money. They would call them uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year. He was calling them rich. They don't have enough money. Businesses that don't have enough money, uh, perhaps over $1 million, they were taxing exorbitantly. And you can't afford this. I mean, most of the people sitting here, if you make one time three or $500,000, you don't want more than half of it taxed away or a large percent. So that's a serious problem we're talking about, a one-time uh, job that you get. Maybe that job won't exist anymore. So it's a very serious problem in this country when uh, people are, uh, are taxed when they can't afford it. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's what we're thinking is that uh, that's the Democrat, I, I, the Bill de Blasio system where he tries to make people poor and, and my union endorsed him by not advocating pay raises, by uh, taxing people who, I mean, it's very, very serious. If you can't afford to like, go to work, you can't afford, you have to take out loans, there's no more money for you. And uh, he tries to fund, say, a children's uh, uh, educational program by borrowing from people who barely have enough household expenses. You can't move every year because you're getting poor because of, uh, they're trying to make people poor and then tax them on top of it. So it's a very serious problem in our country. They've been talking about it since the previous Obama election. And I think this applies especially to artists as well. A lot of them might be in education and other fields with uh, budget problems. So uh, yeah, so that's what was. Well, they say that the way to make a small fortune as an artist is to start off with a big fortune. <laughs> Um, well, I guess that's, that's true. I, certainly, I didn't go into art. I'm, well, first of all, I don't have that kind of talent. Second of all, I don't have that kind of funding. Um, yeah, I know that uh, artists aren't necessarily the most uh, lucrative fields to go into unless you happen to have a lot of expertise. Well, that said, I do have a friend from uh, growing up. She's now, she has a PhD in art history and now has a job, I think, as an appraiser, if I remember correctly. So they are able to earn a living. I think she might even be uh, teaching at the college level as a professor and doing academic research. So there are opportunities for people who study art, but you have to put out a lot of money. I think her family was somewhat rich, um, more than most people, in order to uh, pay that much to go into art history. You're, you're, you seem to have a lot of rich friends, but... Um, well, they're not very rich. That's um, the whole point. They can't afford these taxes, yeah. I, 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 I'm wondering... Um, no, you're saying a new artist who maybe has a talent, but doesn't have a lot of money. Right. Well, what was your own, what, what was your own uh, experience as a kid becoming turned on by art, by music, by painting, by dance, by whatever? Okay, well, I did study the French horn for many years. Uh, my, I, my parents uh, paid for lessons uh, starting when I was in fifth grade. I tried the violin. I didn't like it, so I switched to the French horn. I played in college when it wasn't very popular in uh, wind ensemble orchestra bands. And uh, then I did stop because I didn't have the talents. Like I basically uh, was tone deaf in elementary school and uh, decided to teach myself how to hear unusually uh, the musical notes by uh, cupping my ears. And now I appreciate music, recognize the music. But you picked one of the hardest office. instruments in the world. Well, to play the yeah, you have on. to hear the tones to be able to uh, make the sounds and, and have it uh, have it sound out the right the right notes. And there are some challenges when it gets more difficult. Yeah, it was somewhat challenging, and uh, some people worked harder than me, like the valedictorian types. Someone was better who wasn't talented. But I just decided to go into things I liked. I liked more like French or finance or other interests. But uh, I think it's good when you hear something like the Carmina Burana or very nice pieces, Vivaldi, The Four Seasons, you recognize the music and it's a really good, like Mozart, you start to recognize the patterns. There's a lot that you're able to appreciate about music. And art, the same thing. I mean, I've, I've been, I took art history. I wasn't very good at it. I went to Florence. I saw Botticelli, all the famous artists. And uh, it's good to know things about it and be able to recognize that talent. But uh, it's a bit expensive. I mean, not everyone can afford private lessons or to, or to pay for a college course or go to a different country all the, when they're at that age. So yeah, I think there should be more funding and programs there. And that's basically what I'm trying to say is that from the accounting standpoint, it's very important to spend extra time and dedicate a few uh, salaried employees to uh, scrutinize the budget and um, eliminate people who maybe aren't the same people who even attended tonight, might be at their job, uh, if they are there, not doing anything, collecting salaries. When I showed up at my job at City College, the security guard said, that person over there, she's been collecting a large salary for years. And I don't know what that means, but it sounds like they probably don't deserve it. 
And so there's a lot of people like that probably on the budget. Also, there's buildings that way. Buildings they've sold, probably other buildings that are collecting, I don't know, uh, I don't know, nothing, just collecting dust. And we need to sell buildings that aren't being used or are being used uh, ineff inefficiently. So we think it's important to uh, sell buildings, sell salaries, um, I mean, get rid of uh, salaries for people who, uh, who eliminate salaries for people who aren't doing their job, and also, uh, um, you know, try to uh, do things to fix the budget. Um, yeah, that way, um, perhaps, uh, find sources of revenue more, such as the taxi cab medallions, examine the pension system that everyone's talking about now, make sure it's good for both the people and the city, and also save money. So if they look at the budget, as most of us do in our own bank accounts, or, you know, if you have your own bank account, you see there's been bank fees, you see other accounts offer better interest rates, that's the same thing we need to do with the government budget. And I'm convinced they're not doing that, and that's why they want to tax people who earn a living who can't afford it. Cecilia Berkowitz, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. I'm glad to meet you all. And I'd be happy to speak with you afterward. Yeah, I took luck. a bunch of time, yeah. Nice meeting you. Different so kinds long. of artists in the city. Um, uh.